good afternoon. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for being with uh, us and joining the first international multidisciplinary connected congress. Today, it will be a very interesting day because we are going to address uh, uh, very practical and specific uh, clinical questions in uh, COVID uh, patients. And uh, as the day, the day yesterday was a rather successful uh, event, uh, I have to announce that according to our colleagues from the Everest uh, Travel, the organizing uh, uh, agency, we had about uh, 800 uh, attendees. Uh, our responsibilities today is much more, uh, much bigger, and uh, we have to, to make much better our uh, job. So we start uh, with a big professional in this kind of, uh, of activities, a good friend of mine, and uh, with whom we are working since uh, half of our lives, uh, Ismail Alami, who is uh, the chief of the Department of uh, Thrombosis and Demostasis in uh, Tenon University Hospital, of the Department of Hematology in Tenon University Hospital. And he is uh, a great expert in uh, blood coagulation. And so I will not say any more, and he starts directly. Thank you, Gregoris, for this uh, very kind introduction. I'm so happy to share with you this uh, important webinar, and uh, congratulations for organizing such important meeting uh, and, and based on some numerous experiences. So let's talk now about our experience, as, as you know, Gregoris, regarding the uh, clinical and biological profiling of patients at risk for severe COVID-19. As you know, that SARS-CoV-2, uh, let's say, uh, infection is leading to a multifocal invasion regarding these numerous cell tropism. So it's for sure a massive and major inflammation with an important cytokine release uh, with serious cardiovascular consequences as you heard yesterday. And uh, we, we know all together that in fact, COVID-19 is not only a pneumonia, pneumonia, but it's also a vascular disease with uh, an intravascular storm uh, involving numerous, numerous cells uh, in the vascular compartment and numerous plasma proteins. And these are, of course, leading to a, a very important hypercoagulable state. So COVID-19, is a multidimensional disease and it's linked to, of course, the SARS-CoV-2 invasion, but also to the patient's patient characteristics, and patient comorbidities, and the, the inflammatory response so is of importance because it's inducing different pathological and hemostatic abnormalities, and of course, provoking uh, this uh, prothrombotic uh, disease with uh, sometimes venous thrombosis, but also pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy and, and nuclear infarction or disseminated intravascular coagulation. So now we must audit the patients, and uh, in fact, the prognosis is uh, related to the context, the severity of the COVID 19, uh, let's say, evolution to the patient's again profile and to the coagulopathy again, and uh, is it enough? Because regarding uh, the work of some teams now, trying to establish a COVID-19 coagulopathy staging based on, of course, the lung affection and different, let's say, hemostatic parameters, such as the dimers, platelet count, or the prolongation of PT or APTT. And you see that uh, the higher is the staging, greater should be the therapy intensification. But this is again, a challenging, uh, let's say issue. So in our COMPASS COVID-19 study, we uh, aim to uh, identify the most relevant clinical and hematological risk factors for worsening disease in 
COVID-19 patient which are hospitalized. And for that, we uh, base our work on a prospective observational cohort. You see that just between the 18th of March to the 5th of April, we, uh, in, let's say, included all the uh, COVID-19 confirmed patients with, uh, let's say, a profiling at day one of their admission. And we got a derivation cohort of more 310 patients divided in the so-called conventional world, the C group with two thirds of the patients and the ICU world uh, with the worsening group with one third of the patients. And the disease worsening criteria, you see that it was the acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, the respiratory insufficient symptoms or the reduction of the arterial oxygen saturation, the existence of a shock or myocardial dysfunction or any, let's say, co-infections with acute kidney injury. So these are our criteria. And we exclude women with pregnancy, the cancer with active chemotherapy, and patients receiving already a curative anticoagulant treatment. And these are the clinical characteristics. And you see that comparing the conventional group to the worsening group, you observe that the gender, uh, male gender was more open in the worsening group. And uh, the patients were older in this group. And they got much more frequently cardiovascular risk factors, such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity. And surprisingly, and it's not, again, it's, it's some, there is some, let's say, uh, discussion now in the literature. So the smokers were less, let's say, represented in the working group than in the conventional group. And regarding now the comorbidities, we observe mainly uh, chronic renal impairment or severe renal impairment in these patients. And the Patients with cancer were not so numerous and they are not, let's say, more represented in the worsening group. And as you see, the coagulopathy evaluated through the DIC ISTS score, uh, which is well known, over five points, you see that already more than 8% of the patients in the conventional group got a compensated DIC but it's, of course, it's much more frequent, three, three times more in the worsening group. So the storm is there. Now, what about the hematological characteristics? And uh, here, okay, we observe the uh, DIC ICS score here with the uh, prolongation of PT, the increase of fibrinogen and D-dimers, most often in the worsening group compared to the conventional group with the reduced antithrombin or protein C it's the levels. But regarding now the uh, blood cells, and you see that we got anemia more frequently in the worsening group with a reduction of uh, lymphocytes and of course an increase of the neutrophils and the, uh, the uh, monocytes. Regarding now, the uh, logistic regression univariate analysis. We observe that the more important risk factors related to the worsening group were male gender, the cardiovascular risk factors with obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and uh, regarding the comorbidities, the renal impairment, and regarding the coagulopathy, of course, uh, it's a score, DIC score over five, which are associated with important odd ratios. Regarding now the pathological profile, you see that we got the anemia, the, uh, let's say, the, the reduction of platelets and the reduction of lymphocytes and the, of course, of eosinophils. But now, regarding now the multivariate analysis, we retain only five factors, 
gender, male gender, obesity, an increased ISTH score over five, anemia below 11, and of course, lymphopenia below 1000. And these five, let's say, parameters helped us to build this compass COVID-19 risk assessment model. And we follow the rule of thumb, the so-called event per variable, per variable uh, 10 to one, because we choose to, let's say, keep less than 10 variables to keep the model easy to use. And this is the equation we, we, we let's say, we built. And we developed this RAM in accordance with well-defined adherence scoring rule, rules, you know, the, the tripled, let's say, uh, assessment. And doing that here in our five items, Compass COVID-19 RAM, obesity, male gender, increased BIC score over five, with a re reduction of lymphocytes and a reduction of anemia. And you see that if the score is over 18, because you, you have a score between zero and 54. So over 18, you are considered at high risk for let's say uh, disease aggravation. And if you are below 18, you are at low risk. So it's yes, no, it's a, a very easy and let's say certification, you are in, you're out, you're at high risk or at low risk. And regarding the qualitative characteristic of our RAM, you see that it's very well calibrated between worsening cases and non-worsening cases. And regarding again, the area under the curve is very comfortable and the sensitivity is 81% and negative predictive value is around 90%. So this score has a good accuracy to identify patients at risk. And of course, for disease, let's say deterioration and for maybe uh, requiring uh, an earlier and stronger management. So we uh, followed by a validation cohort based again uh, in our single center uh, recruitment. Uh, from you see here the only uh, two weeks with uh, 120 consecutive patients having COVID-19 confirmation and admitted to uh, the emergency room. And again, we got a two third in the conventional ward and one third in the ICU ward. And we observed exactly the same profile considering the male gender, the uh, older patients, the cardiovascular risk factors present in the worsening group more often than in the conventional group. And of course, the same comorbidities and the, uh, of course, the increase of compensated TIC. And here you see that it was again present in uh, quite limited number in the, the conventional group and much higher number regarding the, the worsening group. But here again, you see that this score was able to identify 90% in the worsening group and 38% in the conventional group with a very good sensitivity, 94% and a very high negative predictive value. So we confirm again, the quality of this run. And very recently, uh, another, uh, let's say clinical risk scoring was uh, published to predict the uh, clinical illness in COVID-19 hospitalized patient. It's a Chinese uh, scoring. You see that they based their uh, analysis on the let's say, retrospective cohort from the National Health Commission of China involving more than, uh, let's say, 575 hospitals. So it's a huge dimension. However, the, the criteria were, were a composite of uh, the ICU admission, invasive ventilation, and uh, um, death. The division cohort was, let's say, only 1,590 patients, because you see it's very limited number of patients per hospital. 
I remember that it's 575 hospitals and a very, very, uh, let's say, small group uh, for the critical illness. It's a group 131 representing only 8% of their uh, cohort. The vaccine cohort uh, was done also based on four hospitals, again, limited numbers, uh, despite one month, let's say, recruitment. However, you see here the patient characteristics in their division cohort. You see that they were, of course, older, that is, uh, uh, as we observe. But regarding the fever, they were not, let's say, in a, uh, let's say more uh, severe situation than the non-critical illness group. Regarding the blood pressure, it was slightly increased in the uh, critical illness group. But you see here the diastolic numbers are quite surprising here with the standard deviation. Anyway, they got more male in the uh, severe uh, critical illness and. You see here that uh, regarding the uh, uh, smokers, they, they were more frequent in the critical illness group here. And regarding the comorbidities, of course, the patient got more numerous comorbidities in the critical illness group. But regarding again here, the, the, the type of comorbidities to observe the cardiovascular uh, risk factors here, of course, and the malignancy was also more represented in the critical illness group. And regarding uh, the, uh, oh, excuse me, and, and regarding again, the, uh, um, regarding uh, now the multivariate logistic analysis, you see that they uh, retain uh, the X-ray abnormalities, the age, hemoptysis, dyspnea, in consciousness, the number of comorbidities, cancer history, the ratio of neutrophils to lymphocytes and the lactate desiderogenase and the, the bilirubin levels. But it was surprising that hemoptysis, uh, inconsciousness, and cancer history got the highest odor ratio, but regarding the others, odor ratio are not so, let's say, impressive, despite being statistically significant. Doing that, they got a very elegant area under the curve, but it just de determining a probability for critical ill events in this COVID-19 patient. And you see that uh, the higher is the, the score and the highest is the probability for being critically ill. And they propose a web calculator, but there is no information regarding the sensitivity, the specificity, and the other the quality of characteristic of this scoring system. And uh, based on the validation cohort, you see that uh, in fact, it's not uh, 710, it's uh, 729 patients. But however, they observe the same, the same profile as they observed in their derivation cohort. And uh, regarding now the main disease, in fact, cancer is not so represented now in the validation cohort than they observed in the derivation cohort. And regarding the comorbidities, there are less cardiovascular risk factors in this cohort. So there are some surprises again. In conclusion, our COMPASS COVID-19 RAM is accurate and really accessible to all, all facilities because it's uh, uh, just requiring a routine, non-specialized hematological laboratory. He got a very good discriminating capacity to stratify patients at high or at low risk of disease aggravation. It's of course original, simple, easy to use, and we identify really early patients requiring, uh, let's say, an optimized target management. We, of course, respect all the triple guidelines and we now, uh, let's say, uh, trying to validate in an external manner our uh, RAM and it's already ongoing with the uh, multinational approach and, and collaboration. And this RAM, it's of course offering, let's say, a tool for the challenging issue to get an earlier and adapted treatment and of course to, let's say, 
uh, try to lead to a more positive clinical outcome in this COVID-19 severe patient. Thank you for your attention. It was a very nice presentation. I enjoyed to discover this uh, COMPASS <laughs> COVID score. <laughs> Yes, it's different to, to, to hear it from uh, somebody else. So, uh, the discussion will follow at the end of the session. So, we have uh, a lot of time to develop all the questions and uh, the inquiries about all these uh, intriguing topics. And uh, now I will uh, invite Professor Spanakis, who is, his professor, who, who is professor of virology in uh, the University of uh, Athens and also head of the laboratory of the Hellenic Healthcare Group. And uh, he will present the algorithms uh, for the biological diagnosis of uh, coronavirus infections and the COVID-19 uh, disease. Thank you very much. Good evening from Greece. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but uh, last minute I have a problem in my camera settings. I don't know what is happening. I, I have no camera. That's why you cannot see me. Uh, hopefully, uh, my microphone is working, so uh, you can hear me. Um, so, uh, first of all, let me give my sincere thanks to Professor Yeroz Yafas for uh, inviting me to this webinar, and of course, to all members of the organizing committee. Uh, my short presentation, which is entitled like, Algorithms for Biological Diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2, infection and COVID-19. Uh, we'll try to focus on the different approaches for the detection of the virus, either in cases of infection or in cases of asymptomatic carriers. Um, so, um, as an introduction, uh, I would say that uh, uh, this pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, demonstrated the essential role of, uh, uh, of diagnostics in the control of uh, communicable disease. As in the early phase of the pandemics, we didn't have many ways to reduce the spread of the virus. Um, the only way we had, and this is yet the crucial point of our intervention, is to rapidly detect the people that have the virus or the infection and through tracing of their contacts to implement quarantine or measures of isolation and social distancing. Unfortunately, neither a vaccine has been developed nor an antiviral drug or other chemotherapy method has the potential to be implemented widely in all patients to help reduce the spread of the pandemic strain. Uh, Currently, the molecular uh, assay in respiratory specimens uh, is the reference standard for COVID-19 diagnosis, and in many cases, the only way um, to detect uh, the virus in asymptomatic carriers. Uh, I would like to mention that there is not only the real-time PCR-based methods, uh, but adequate results have been produced with the use of LAMP and uh, CRISP methods that are two isothermal ways to amplify the nucleic acid of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, some countries have chosen uh, the massive deployment of molecular diagnostics for case finding in order to flatten the epidemic curve, a tactic that unfortunately cannot be used globally since the availability of reagent is restricted. Despite the difficulties in having huge amount of diagnostic reagents, urge clinical and public health needs are driving a global effort to increase testing capacity. The need of diagnosis during one, person, one person's illness is crucial for many reasons. First of all, is serving the early screening of the asymptomatic person in order to avoid contacts and spread of the virus to others, and in addition, to monitor its contacts as well. So we need a test that reveals the asymptomatic carriers 
before they spread the virus widely. Secondly, the urgent diagnosis of an affected person, sorry, of an affected person uh, that is developing COVID-19 disease is maybe crucial for his life as we may delay the onset of pulmonary disease and its consequences. Of course, all treatment initiation decisions are relying on the result of the diagnostic method. Even for the convalescence uh, period, the monitoring of shading of the virus is helpful for epidemiological purposes, as well as for the de-isolation of the patient. Of course, diagnostic testing is the only tool we have for the surveillance of the pandemics um, and for taking active or passive measures. I have to clarify that one test that is well suited for one case, for, for one use case, such as epidemiologic surveillance, may be completely inadequate for another use, such as rapid screening of, of symptomatic patients for allocation of personal protective equipment, etc. For test results to enable a specific clinical decision, test developers, policymakers, and clinicians need to consider each of these with respect to the intention of testing and the population being tested as specifically as possible. For the moment, most use cases placed upon the green and gray bar, as you see in the slide, are best met by nucleic acid amplification tests, whereas detection of host-derived antibodies directed again against SARS-CoV-2 will be crucial for surveillance, epidemic forecasting, and determination of SARS-CoV-2 immunity. In order to reveal the differences between the usage of each diagnostic method, I would like, first of all, to categorize them in four major types. In, in first row, you can see the RT-PCR or NAT assays, which is the abbreviation for nucleic acid amplification techniques, which are currently the reference methods or the gold standard methods for the diagnosis of symptomatic disease. These methods have an excellent positive and negative predictive value, but um, our slight things are, are a slightly different while examining the incubation or uh, the or a symptomatic phase um, and the convalescence phase. In these two phases, while the positive predictive value of the techniques remain excellent, near 100%, the negative predictive value is unknown and in many cases far below the 95% that is the value that we trust. Nevertheless, they are still our best choice of all comparative methods that are, that are being developed so far. And they also can be used in passive surveillance studies because of their excellent positive predictive value. In the second row, you see the POC point of care uh, NAT assays. They are very similar in technology with the previous tests based in the same principles, but tailored made for implementation beside the patients without the need of an expertise laboratory. Their diagnostic value is very comparable to the reference methods, despite a slightly lower uh, sensitivity in detecting the RNA of uh, SARS-CoV-2. The negative predictive value uh, of these techniques are similar to those of reference methods. And if you also consider the inability of mass implementation of POC diagnostic methods, then you can imagine that these techniques are not an excellent choice for epidemiological purposes, even if they are presenting excellent positive predictive values. <clears throat> 
Now in third row, you can see the antigen detection methods, point of care methods, maybe, that are currently being developed. Having a good positive predictive value in the, diagnostic, in the diagnosis of symptomatic disease, not as good as the molecular techniques, but an insufficient negative predictive value during both the incubation and the covalescence phase, phases of the infection. Because of their lower sensitivity than the NAT methods, they cannot be used for epidemiological surveillance as they will underestimate the affected population. Lastly, we can see the antibody detection assays, either as POC or laboratory-based, that are the only methods uh, that may be capable to estimate the individual's or population's immunity against SARS-CoV-2, despite some controversial issues that may appear. The utility of antibody detection assays for diagnosing acute infections is probably very limited around the time of symptom onset, uh, when viral setting and transmission risk seem to be highest. Thus, although such tests may have a role among persons presenting late in the course of their infection, the potential for misuse is high. Another issue is that someone has to take into account with these assays the low specificity of the detection of antibodies that are, that are active against only uh, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Given the fact that in patient serum are circulating a mixture of anti-coronavirus antibodies, how sure could we be that the measurement is excluding the detection of past infections from other coronavirus members? Think about a similar problem, how difficult is to distinguish between antibodies against H1N1 or H3N2 for uh, the influenza infections, for example. And you will see how difficult is to solve the problem of specificity for these methods. Uh, in this slide, you can see some of the approved commercial methods as of uh, 4th of April for the NAT-based techniques. And uh, in the bottom, you can see the only uh, three NAT methods that uh, are approved for use outside the clinical labor laboratory setting. Uh, in this link below, you can see the total, uh, the total of, of the approved commercial methods until today. It's a complete list of, of, of the methods that uh, uh, are being approved until today. CDC, WHO, and many other organizations around the globe have already published fact sheets for healthcare providers in order to give a guideline for testing. In these fact sheets, someone has to meet some epidemiological and or clinical criteria in order to be eligible for testing. Given the fact that there is no test that can be used as a prognostic factor for the development of the disease, this criteria should be taken into serious consideration in order not to overload the laboratory capacities of each country or each hospital, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now I will overcome the molecular testing as uh, Professor Chakris spoke yesterday about the molecular testing and uh, its benefits as well as, as its limitations. Uh, just one word for me, from me. I think uh, molecular testing is uh, the only way to monitor the pandemic and the only way that we, that we could isolate asymptomatic individuals as well as provide adequate treatment to symptomatic patients as soon as possible in order to reduce the impact of COVID-19 uh, as an infection. So for me, molecular techniques are in the lead, both for epidemiological as well as clinical reasons. Uh, but certainly, an excellent method is relying on the specimen collection. So 
The proper collection of the specimens is the most important step in the laboratory diagnosis of infectious disease. A specimen that is not collected correctly may lead to false negative test results. And the collection guidelines should follow standard recommended procedures. So uh, the most um, reliable uh, uh, specimen for the, for the testing for COVID-19, especially for asymptomatic patients, is a specimen that comes from the upper respiratory tract. So the best way to reveal an asymptomatic um, carrier is to take from him a nasopharyngeal swab or an oropharyngeal swab. Um, of course, as the infection uh, is, uh, is going to the, to, to the lungs, the, the best sample, the best specimen is a lower respiratory tract specimen like uh, ball or sputum. So the best specimen for asymptomatic individuals is the nasopharyngeal swab, while uh, a patient with a pulmonary disease is better diagnosed by a sputum or a ball collection specimen. Now, for uh, serology assays, um, of course, we need to uh, optimize uh, the testing outcome. Uh, we have to keep in mind that in a high prevalence setting, the positive predictive value increases while in a low prevalence setting, the positive predictive value is dropping as we have many false positive results. Likewise, in a high prevalence setting, the negative predictive value declines, uh, where in a low prevalence setting, it increases. In most countries, the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 antibody is expected to be low. So uh, that testing might result in relatively more false, false positive results and fewer negative results. So maximizing specificity and thus positive predictive value is preferred in most cases. Uh, I have, we have three strategies to maximize the specificity and thus the positive predictive value. One strategy is choosing a test with very high specificity, over 99.5%, that will yield a high positive predictive value in populations with prevalence uh, almost uh, around 5% percent or more. The second strategy is to focus testing on persons with a high probability of having SARS-CoV-2. These persons are the persons with a history of COVID-19 in illness. And the third strategy is to combine two tests with different unique characteristics, thus improving the positive predictive value. In this table, we can see how the positive predictive value increases even in low background prevalence if we use two orthogonal tests with the same specificity and sensitivity. As you can see, in the first column, the prevalence is, uh, 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 let's say, from the two, per, if, if it is in uh, 2%, then the positive predictive value for one test is around 30% and the positive predictive value for two orthogonal tests that, that share the same specificity and sensitivity is coming near 90%. So if we combine two tests with the same sensitivity and specificity uh, percentages, then we can um, ri rise the, 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 the total sensitivity and the total positive predictive value of the diagnostic method. So uh, for serological testing, uh, although the presence of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies when detected using a testing algorithm with high positive predictive value for the context of use, uh, likely indicates at least some degree of immunity until the durability and duration of immunity is established, it cannot be assumed that individuals with truly positive antibody tests results are protected from future infection. 
Now, asymptomatic persons who test positive by serologic testing and uh, who, are, who, who are without recent history of a COVID-19 compatible illness have a low likelihood of active infection and should follow the recommendations to prevent infection with SARS-CoV-2 and otherwise continue with normal activities. Secondly, persons who have a COVID-19 compatible or confirmed illness should follow previous guidance regarding, regarding resumption of normal activities. And lastly, there should be no change in clinical practice or use of personal protective equipment by healthcare workers and first responders who test positive for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. Uh, these are the uh, general considerations concerning the serological testing. And with this slide, I would like to thank you, not for watching, but listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Nico. Uh, it was clear an overview, and uh, we will discuss the most precise clinical utility with the uh, many questions that have uh, arrived during your uh, presentation. So now I will move uh, rapidly, and I will present the algorithms uh, for the uh, prevention of uh, VT. So. The algorithms for the prevention of VT are based uh, in COVID patients, are based on the concept that the, uh, first of all, COVID patients are uh, acutely ill medical patients, uh, hospitalized as acu acutely ill medical patients. This means that uh, normally, and this was the initial concept for the beginning of uh, the epidemic, they should fit uh, into the general model that we learned since the years of uh, 2000 that uh, venous thromboembolism is, uh, in acutely ill medical patients is practically a nosocomial disease. And uh, indeed, uh, based on the studies of the years of 2000, uh, yeah, of the, the decade, decade of 2000, 2000 it, it is known that, that they, if we do not give form of prophylaxis in, in patients uh, uh, hospitalized for an acute medical, medical illness, illness, there will be about 15% uh, of uh, documented asymptomatic PT episodes and uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat less uh, symptomatic episodes, which is around uh, 5%. And administration of uh, thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin or uh, fondaparinux decreases by about uh, 50 to 60% uh, the rate uh, of VT. However, in those years, we face the question, who is, uh, should we do prophylaxis to everybody who is hospitalized for uh, acute uh, medical illness? or we should uh, make a risk assessment model to identify uh, the most uh, high-risk patients in order to improve uh, uh, the, efficacy, the, uh, the efficacy and the tolerance uh, ratio. And the response, uh, the, the image was rather similar also in the acutely, critically ill medical patients hospitalized in uh, ICU. And here you see the data from the years of 2003 that about 30% of the ICU patients, if they do not receive thromboprophylaxis in the years of 2000, uh, had to experience VTE. Most of these episodes were documented with uh, echo Doppler, and not all of them was, were classical symptomatic VTE episodes. Uh, so, however, since the years of 2003, uh, the practices in ICU significantly improved beyond the application of thromboprophylaxis, and it is expected that if we do not give thromboprophylaxis to patients in ICU, something which it is not easy to imagine, because of the improvement of the, of the practices, probably the, the, the rate of VT episode is rather lower than the 30% that it was in the, in the beginning of 2000. What is the situation for the COVID? Uh, we have uh, a very recent uh, study, which, were, which is an autopsy study coming from Germany, and uh, analyzed and, uh, autopsies from uh, 80 patients that, who died uh, uh, with confirmed COVID. And here you see the classification of the probability that the, the death is due to the COVID. The Germans, and I suppose all the uh, legal medicine uh, departments ap apply these uh, these classifications. Uh, 
And uh, the first three categories are those which are firmly related with the COVID virus, either the virus as the, un- the infection as the unique uh, uh, cause of death or as an accelerating cause uh, leading to the death in a context uh, which, into which there are some other comorbidities. As you can see here, uh, most of the patients that died in Hamburg were uh, uh, at the level of th- one, two, or three. And there is an interesting finding that seven patients out of 10 to which acute uh, or topic pneumonia uh, or ARDS was combined with an infectious cause had a fatal pulmonary embolism. Already so, we have a, a very important documentation that has been already published from other series, uh, from the USA and uh, from, uh, from China. And I also know from some published cases uh, from Greece that the med- some medical uh, legal medicine colleague, uh, colleagues uh, send it to me. It is, a, it is a very common situation to have fatal, VT, fatal pulmonary embolism in patients uh, who die with VT. Uh, by with COVID. However, if you see here the pie, you see a very interesting finding in Germany that about uh, 35% of the patients who died with COVID uh, died at home, either in the nursing homes or in their own homes. And of course, uh, 85% of the patients uh, had, a, uh, had a cardiovascular disease, which fits uh, very well th- with the profile of the risk, uh, of the clinical risk profile that is Marila analyzed uh, in, he, in the first lecture of the session. So we have uh, a situation where people with COVID dies either in the hospital or at home. There are, most of them are cardiovascular patients. And uh, something much more interesting, uh, is that uh, sorry? Is that ten out of the twenty-six patients, meaning thirty-eight percent, died at home and had VT? And this is something very important because if you combine it with the fact that forty uh, percent of the patients who died had the VT, means that VT is manifested in COVID patients in a context independently of the hospitalization or not. So we should not consider, we should revise our classical approach that uh, hospitalization is one of the major risk factors for VTE in acutely ill medical patients. Second, 12% of patients have documented VTE and uh, moreover, uh, had, uh, and, uh, associate, this VTE is associated with pulmonary embolism. And there is something very characteristic that the, the big clot which is formed into the uh, pulmonary uh, vascular system is a, is a very elastic and particular clot. And uh, 12% had also had a non-fatal VT, uh, pulmonary embolism. And in 15 male patients, there were thrombi into the prostatic venous, confirming that we have a phenomenon of blood coagulation activation as it was described from the beginning by Ismail and yesterday by Anna Falanga. It's a systematic activation of coagulation that leads uh, to microthrombosis in the circulation uh, in the whole body. So please keep in mind uh, this figure that 10 out of 26 patients with VTE who died at home, uh, with VTE died at home. So the data we have today from the autopsy studies, and they are confirmed from the China to USA, I, 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 I repeat, so that VT in COVID patient is not a complication of, of hospitalization. But let's have a look now, what does it happen to hospitalized patients? Here is a review of the ensemble of the, of the studies that have been published until uh, last uh, week. And uh, this review states, uh, makes a very, very important uh, statement. First, if you see the rates of VTE in patients in IC unit raises up to 50 or 60% of the patients, and there is a study in 92% of patients. And the rates of the VT, of, uh, VTE in the conventional world is about 10% of the patients. However, this is very far away from what we knew from the studies that the classical studies in uh, in 
the ICU patients, so acutely ill medical patients, in the beginning of the of the 2000, because all these patients received thromboprophylaxis when they arrived at the hospital, or some of them received thromboprophylaxis because they they were considered to be acutely ill medical patients, and the physicians stratified them using one of the two or three risk assessment models. This means that practically we have a very violent presentation of VTE, which is unexpected according to our previous experience because it is different and it cannot be sufficiently captured by the available risk assessment model. So we have apparently some misleading decisions regarding to the application of thromboprophylaxis in patients who were erroneously classified as intermediate or low risk. And moreover, in patients who received thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin principally, using the recommended doses, for instance, enoxaparin 4,000 units, there was a treatment failure. And this treatment failure was much more impressive when you see in details the data from the patients in ICU uh, who received the uh, uh, unfractionated heparin. And uh, this analysis on unfractionated heparin very early gave a very important alert that uh, the resistance, the rate of resistance to unfractionated heparin, it's very important. Uh, the authors performed an analysis of uh, these studies since uh, they were about uh, 1,700 uh, cases included. And this meta-analysis confirmed the, the initial impression that patients in ICU units have a rate of VTE of about 30%, although they receive mostly all of them antithromboprophylaxis uh, with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. And also... Uh, patients who are ma in the ma their majority hospitalized in the conventional, wo uh, conventional world, they have about 9% of symptomatic VT. And I want to underline this. The studies that were performed in the beginning of the new millennium were, uh, were done using surrogate bodies. Here we have a very important uh, uh, frequency of uh, venous thromboembolism, which is symptomatic. This means that the patients are suffering, or some of them are dying because of this uh, clotting in the vein system. The question in this, uh, in this uh, situation is, uh, what drug should we use? Of course, uh, we, one uh, approach is to use uh, uh, the dogs, because dogs are easy, is easy to administer. There is no contact of the nursing personnel with the patients in order to perform the injections. And uh, we do not bother a lot of the patient. But as you can see here, the drugs for the hospitalized patients with COVID who started to take some antiviral drug or other uh, experimental therapies uh, have some drug-to-drug uh, uh, -drug interactions. Why? Because all of the drugs are metabolized in the liver and they require a glycoprotein in order to be transferred into the blood. And they can have a competitive action with uh, some of the antiviral drugs. So based on this, uh, this pharmacological data, it was, uh, support, it was assumed from the beginning that the use of DOACs is not a good idea for the hospitalized patients. Instead of them, low molecular weight heparins, which is the all-time classic drug, fits much, be fits much better to the profile uh, and the pharmacological agents uh, used to the COVID-19 patients. So... Uh, in the same way that uh, everybody in, uh, in the planet started to, to think about the prophylaxis uh, for the hospitalized patients, we set, up, uh, we set up very early in our hospital together with Ismail and uh, uh, Muriel Fartouk from the, uh, the head of uh, and her colleagues from the ICU units of our hospital, uh, a, a quite aggressive protocol that was applied very early from the almost one week before the peak of the epidemia, epidemic in, uh, in uh, Paris. And this uh, protocol consists of the uh, use of enoxaparin because this is the drug that we have in our hospital. And we had the fight in order to use also tinzaparin, which has to be, can be used uh, in uh, patients uh, with renal uh, insufficiency and uh, creatinine clearance uh, less than 20, uh, less than 30. And uh, for patients with uh, very severe renal insufficiency, 
uh, we started to use uh, calciparin, uh, unfractionated heparin, 5,000 5, units. Since we didn't know what we have to, you know, to face, we set up a, a very precise and uh, careful protocol for detection of uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia. And uh, nearby, we performed, uh, we set up a, a panel of biological tests that we called it the COVID coag uh, panel, which is consists of the hemogram, the platelet count, the prothrombin time, APTT, uh, fibrinogen, T dimers levels, measurement of the antitene activity of uh, heparins, measurement of uh, antithrombin and protein C activity, which are natural coagulation inhibitors implicated in uh, disseminating intravascular coagulation. And they were used in order to, to, to derive the compass COVID uh, score that Ismail uh, El Alami presented in uh, the first lecture. So, and also we set up a process in order to evaluate the plot formation kinekinetics and the plated aggregation and the plated activation status. Uh, today, ev we, we, everybody agrees that we should start with a low molecular weight heparins. Fondaparinux probably could be an alternative, particularly in the patients when we have uh, some uh, questions about the, uh, about the heat. And uh, also, uh, we should consider that the tinzaparin and dalteparin are the two low molecular weight heparins that can be used in patients with uh, quite heavy uh, renal insufficiency. Using this approach, we and other groups also in Europe uh, started to have a more, a more tailored strategy for the management of uh, thromboprophylaxis. Because from the beginning, we understood that this evolutive inflammatory process the triggered by the virus necessitates an evolution, evolution, an evolution in the to, uh, and the intensification of the prophylactic schema. That's why we combined the tests uh, with the dosing of uh, low molecular weight heparins, and we, as others, uh, used the, in the first phase the measurement of D-dimers in order to evaluate the efficacy of uh, D-dimers. Now, new other biomarkers are under under evaluation, and I, I hope that soon we will uh, publish uh, the data from uh, the other biomarkers that may uh, help us to optimize better the intensity of the antithrombotic uh, prophylaxis. Of course, uh, as you understood, this is an approach that we set up in Paris. There are some other, some other groups that uh, from the beginning wanted to try to make a risk assessment models. The results demonstrate that the most appropriate strategy is to consider that all patients with COVID that are hospitalized are at high risk. It is not necessary to make a, to do risk assessment. You should start immediately uh, thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin and adapt the dose progressively according to the evolution of the dimers or other biomarkers. And this is the main point of the ensemble of the, of the international guidelines that have been published up to date. And it is uh, summarized in a, in a chapter for the vascular patients that we are about to publish uh, from uh, the European group of uh, VAS. The other question is uh, how long this risk uh, lasts after the after the discharge from the hospital. And this is the classical approach that we had since the exclaim study beginning of uh, the years of 2005, uh, 2006. But the case with uh, COVID is something different because the risk starts uh, the risk of VT starts very early. When the patient is in hospital, he is already in high risk in a very with a peak which is also very high. So we expect that the continuum of the risk goes beyond the, the hospitalization. And this is why uh, it is necessary to apply a thromboprophylaxis, but in this case, in selected patients. What we can do? One option is the low molecular weight heparin. For instance, there is the exclaim study from uh, with an oxaparin. The other way is uh, the use of uh, DOAX. Uh, betrixaban or rivaroxaban, because already this question has been faced, uh, has been tried to be answered by the, uh, these two studies in uh, post-discharge uh, acutely in medical patients. 
Also, what do we know? We know that the patients have cardiovascular, COVID patients have cardiovascular risk factors, and the presence of cardiovascular risk factors are independent factors for VTE, even beyond hospitalization. The second is that COVID patients have vasculitis, vascularitis. This vascularitis, uh, because of the endothelial cell activation, it is not treated A easily. The lesions on the endothelial cells uh, la are lasting a long uh, period, so they continue to have a factor of four in the multiplication of the risk, even after, after the hospitalization. Third, these patients, most of them have acutely respiratory, acute respiratory failure, which is also an independent predictor for VTE. Finally, we, there are a lot of circumstances that are accumulated to our COVID patients, that most of them continue to be present after hospitalization. And here we add a fourth situation, which is hospitalization per se. So increased alert is needed for re-evaluation of post-discharge post -discharge, uh, uh, VTE risk. And the tool that we have today is the improved score together with the dimers, although it has not been created for the COVID patient, it has been validated to the, uh, into the studies of uh, Mariner, uh, exactly to the evaluation to control the efficacy and the safety of ribaroxaban in long-term uh, use uh, for thromboprophylaxis after uh, hospitalization for acute medical illness. Here I show you the exclaim study. It was, done, it, is, it was done in the years of 2000, 2010, showed some efficacy of an enoxaparin administration in, uh, for one month after the end of the hospitalization. But as we can see here, this efficacy caused uh, some bleedings. The same profile was found with Rivaroxaba. It is effective to prevent the second wave of uh, thrombosis out of the hospital, but you have to pay uh, the price of, uh, of bleeding if you are not doing a good selection of the patients at high risk. And this uh, response was given how I can do the, the selection with uh, high-risk patients with a Mariner study, where the patients were screened using the improved score and the D-dimer levels before uh, hospital discharge. Uh, based to the score, uh, high-risk uh, profile, they were randomized to receive rivaroxaban uh, or placebo. They, the patients who received rivaroxaban and were in high-risk uh, category had a benefit regarding the, the rate of uh, VTE uh, without significantly high uh, uh, thrombotic hemorrhagic episodes. So from this point of view, this approach has been adapted in the is going to be adapted from the international guidelines, meaning that systemic evaluation, systematic evaluation of VTE risk is recommended for all COVID patients before hospital discharge using the improved score and the D dimers. The patients who are at high risk, and if they have no, uh, creatinine clearance higher than 30 milliliters per minute, uh, can receive either rivaroxaban 10 milligrams once a day or a low molecular weight heparin adjusted uh, to the basis of uh, the weight for 30 days. And of course, we have the other big question. If somebody is coming in with high, high risk, means that he, when he is at home, he's already some of them are in the, at high risk, and uh, taking into consideration for many variable reasons. Some patients with COVID cannot have access to the hospital, uh, or they are treated at home. We should be aware about the risk of VT to those patients who have benefit the medical care at home. And how we can do the stratification, the identification of these, uh, of these patients at home. The only tool we have is, again, the improved risk uh, assessment model without the D-dimers in this time. And uh, to those patients that the, physicians, the physician uh, estimates that the risk for VT is high and that uh, the renal clearance allows administration of the thrombotic drugs, uh, these patients can receive uh, rivaroxaban or prophylactic and the weight adjusted doses of uh, low molecular weight heparin. Here we should consider that the rivaroxaban has an, uh, has an advantage because this does not require daily injection, so no nursing, no risk uh, for exposition, uh, uh, professional exposition to uh, coronavirus uh, contamination. 
And uh, in conclusion, we must keep in mind that COVID is an hypercoagulable disease. COVID is a vascular disease. COVID uh, and, and thrombosis is part of the same game. It is not in another extra uh, factor that is going to generate thrombosis, but it's the disease itself. Is a multifactorial disease, so we need to assess profile particularly in, to those patients uh, hospitalized uh, who have received medical care at home and those after hospital discharge. All the patients who are in the hospital should receive start the hospitalization with uh, low molecular weight heparin thromboprophylaxis and then adaptation of the of the dose uh, com, uh, according to the clinical profile and today with the evolution of the dimers. And the use of DORC, as Ismail wrote here, should be discussed uh, as an option to abolish uh, such a coagulopathy triggered by COVID. Thank you very much. Can you see it? So, so now is a and uh, he's specialist in uh, COVID and also in thrombosis. And he is in the medical world, uh, and he will present the whole management of the patients uh, with COVID who are hospitalized in the medical in conventional medical world. Thank you very much, Professor Gerotsiafas. I'm going to share now my presentation. I think it's here. OK. You can see it, right? OK. So, uh, yes, uh, I work in a venous thrombomalacin unit in the internal medicine section department in the hospital Gregorio Marañón in Madrid. Uh, now it's a temporarily a COVID unit because basically we are uh, uh, managing, still managing patients with COVID. I'm still in charge of COVID patients. So um, this is the, um, uh, how the presentation is going to, to be, uh, how I have organized my presentation. So first of all, I want to give you some hints, some details, uh, brief details about how the COVID-19 crisis was in Spain. Uh, in Spain, we had a, a, we are one of the, unfortunately, one of the uh, countries in the world with more cases. Uh, we had to, uh, here you have a picture of uh, medicalized hotels. Uh, this is the field hospital here in Madrid. And this is one of the many, many ICU we had to open for COVID patients. So we had the first uh, isolated cases by the end of January. Uh, and we have to say that uh, because we didn't take it uh, seriously enough, uh, I'm talking about scientific uh, 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 scientists and also politicians, uh, full preventive measures uh, were not taken. And by the first week of March, you know, everything went very, very fast. And cases multiplied mainly in the cities where we had more more. Uh, more, more inhabitants. It's, this is Madrid and, and Barcelona main, mainly. And uh, by the 14th of, of March, it was declared the, the Spain lockdown, the situation of uh, the state of, of alarm. And then uh, everyone was uh, said to remain home and uh, all that you know uh, from the news. Uh, by uh, the 7th of June, we had 242,000 confirmed patients, uh, cases with PCR, and around 17, uh, 27. Uh, a thousand um, deaths. Uh, by estimation, we know that the, the uh, number of uh, cases in the population, it's around five, six percent of the population. So it's around two million Sp Spanish, uh, Spanish people are, have been infected by the virus. Um, that's the estimation. And in my hospital, which is one of the biggest hospitals in the country, we, had, uh, we, had, we uh, treated uh, around 5,000 cases. Uh, 260, uh, 2,600 2, required hospital admission and more than 150 patients required ICU admission. And we had to increase by five the number, the capacity of our ICU. We open beds in the ICU beds in the operating rooms. And also we had to adapt the university library of our hospital to admit patients in the ICU because there's actually, there was no space for these patients. Uh, as of today, we have the situation is much better, but we still have around 80, 90 patients admitted, 15 of them still in the ICU uh, setting. So how do we organize the hospital? Well, basically, what we do, what we did, I mean, internal medicine had a priority role uh, because, among other things, we have we have the department with more with more uh, physicians. So what we did is we had a, 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 each ward had around 40 patients. So we, what we did, we had 22 wards led by an internal medicine professional and 
two words led by immunology and one word led by infectious diseases. And uh, since we, we were not uh, enough uh, people to rule this department, what we did is we did multidisciplinary teams uh, led by internal medicine in, in, in most cases, but with uh, residents and specialists from geriatri uh, geriatricians, endocrinologists, hematologists, pediatricians, surgeons, um, and the intensive care units, units were basically uh, uh, led by intensivists, anesthesiologists, and also cardiologists. Out of the hospital, we had the primary care for non-severe cases. We had medicalized hotels uh, for isolation of cases, patients who could not go home to, uh, because they could not be isolated at home. Uh, we, we opened a field hospital in Madrid with uh, more than a thousand uh, beds for patients who required mostly observation, but not very severe cases. And we also medicalized nursing homes to avoid patients go from nursing homes to have to be admitted to the hospital. So going in deeper, how, how, do, how do we organize this medical world in a situation of, of pandemic, of crisis? So uh, first of all, it's important to uh, restrain the uh, access to uh, the units and the rooms. So basically, we have uh, closed doors in all of the hospital. Uh, also, the room of patients are sealed, so there is no uh, risk of contamination. And we, uh, there was an important restriction of people entering the room, only one doctor or nurse or assistant per patient uh, each time. And all rooms where there was devices with high flow oxygen or aerosolization, which is not common, aerosolization is not commonly needed in these patients. But if that was the case, it has to be clearly specified and avoid entrance uh, unless it's strictly necessary. And in that case, you need to wear FFP3 masks to avoid the uh, contagion. And uh, this is important because we learned, we learned this the hard way. Uh, crash carts must be equipped with all the material for the situation of emergency, which is gonna happen because it's very common to have patients with uh, uh, cardiac arrest uh, when there is a uh, pandemic with co co uh, coronavirus. So everything has to be opened and ready to use so you can run, you can uh, safely wear yourself, uh, equip yourself and enter the room with everything you're going to need to treat these patients because otherwise it's going to be really, really uh, um, a situation of, of mess. Um, general recommendations, things that seem simple but are actually very, very helpful it's, for example, measuring oxygen saturation of patients every time someone enters the room. No matter if it's the nurse, the assistant, or the doctor, every time someone uh, enters the room, we need to assess the oxygen saturation of the patients because even though they look well, oxygen saturation can really drop before the patient even can tell it. Uh, at the end of the day, we have to clearly indicate those patients with DNR order on the nursing control board so we clearly distinguish uh, those who, in case of an emergency, need to be resuscitated. And this is very important in the daily medical records. We only, we, uh, it's very important to record the days from the beginning of symptoms, the days from the COVID diagnosis, and the days from the start of each drug. This is because we know, we now know that patients around the seventh and ninth day of, of beginning of the symptoms is when patients uh, enter the inflammatory phase and they, they, they get worse, the, the clinical uh, situation gets worse. And we have to be aware of that uh, and really uh, watch out for these patients because those are the ones who might need ICU admission. Communication with, rel with relatives, it was prohibited to uh, enter the to visit its, visits to the hospital were prohibited during the pandemic. And we basically ha had uh, updates uh, through the phone. We provided patients with tablet, uh, tablets or smartphones to communicate with their families, and this really helped a lot. Uh, and we only allowed visits in really restrained cases of patients uh, in a situation uh, of, of um, close to uh, death or situations where the patient really need to be with their family. But this, as, I, as I said, this was very restricted. This is the essential material in the medical world. I'm not going to stop here because this is uh, probably very basic. Uh, but this recommendation uh, I can do uh, for uh, each room, we recommend to have one pulse oximeter for every patient, one stethoscope, one sigma manometer, and of course, alcohol or disinfectant gel on the door inside another room uh, in each room and for each uh, patient. This is going to help a lot when, you, when we do the, the rounds in the morning. Um, so once we will have a patient in the hospital, uh, a, a question that... Uh, 
they ask me uh, very often is, uh, when do I have to test the patients? How often do I have to repeat blood tests or repeat x-ray? And um, of course, this is not uh, standardized, but uh, I can give recommendations according to what we have seen in clinical practice. Uh, so this is, um, fortunately, uh, patients with uh, COVID-19, they don't require very like fancy uh, blood tests uh, when, we, uh, when they are admitted. In most cases, they are a common test in clinical practice. So uh, we obtain in the first assessment of these patients in the emergency, we obtain a cell blood count, coagulation. Uh, blood gases are mostly, not, in most cases, not required because we know what we're going to see. We're going to see low oxygen. So in most cases, oxygen saturation with a pulse oximeter is enough, but uh, severe patients are going to require, to require uh, blood gases, arterial blood gases. And biochemistry. So I, I summarize here the common findings in these patients and findings that are not that common. For example, in the blood count, lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia are common, especially thrombocytopenia, especially in severe patients, as it has been commented before. And the coagulation is very common to find elevated fibrinogen, uh, mildly, uh, in, in mild cases or moderate cases, uh, elevated INR or prothrombin time. And D dimer, it's uh, uh, commonly elevated. The dimer, we know it's related with a poor prognosis, but it, it is not always the rule. We also say, see, see patients who are doing well and actually do well with strikingly high levels of the dimer. We've seen levels of the dimer we have never seen even in patients with thrombosis and cancer. I'm talking about numbers of 70,000, 80,000 uh, the dimer. This is something we have never seen before. And as I said, we work in a BTE clinic and we see the dimers all every day. Uh, in biochemistry, the most common findings are elevate, elevated C-reactive proteins, uh, mildly elevated transaminases, and uh, elevated levels of uh, creatine kinase and uh, LDH. Uh, procalcitonin, on the other way, is typically not elevated because that's a finding that has to rise the suspicion of bacterial infection more than COVID-19 infection. Kidney injury is not common in severe or, sorry, in mild or moderate forms of the disease, but in the ICU setting is actually pretty common, but in the medical world is not the, the, the most common finding. So in the medical world, uh, we, when we want to reassess the, the patient, uh, the, the blood test, we ordered the same tests, but we added the levels of ferritin and interleukin-6. I say in the medical world because these tests are usually not available in, in the emergency, not in our hospital. So we uh, assess ferritin and interleukin-6 patients to have an uh, assessment of the inflammatory situation of the patient, and also HIV tests, especially in those patients who are treated with lopinavir, ritonavir, because uh, we need to know if, the, if, there is, if they are positive and there, if there might be a resistance to the, to the drug. But uh, as I said, this, these tests are common in clinical practice. So the question is, how often do we have to test patients? Um, for blood tests, we always recommend to perform the first uh, I mean, of, of, after the first assessment in the emergency room, we recommended one uh, at least 24, uh, at 48 hours after the first assessment. And especially if the uh, inflammatory markers are elevated or the uh, progression of the patient is, is uh, bad, we recommend repeating every 40, 24, 48 hours to assess this inflammatory state. That is going to help us decide some treatments, some anti-inflammatory treatments that we will comment uh, in a few slides. Um, and this is very important about the chest X-ray. How often do we have to repeat a chest X-ray? Uh, in the common pneumonias, in bacterial pneumonias, we are used to uh, follow uh, clinical guidance. I mean, if the patient is doing well, we don't need to repeat a chest X-ray in, mo in, in most cases. And if the patient is doing bad, we repeat the chest X-ray. This is probably not helpful in COVID-19 patients because of this. The progression of the pulmonary infiltrates can and thus precede clinical deterioration. So my advice is you repeat chest X-ray, even if the patient is doing at least stable or even a little bit better, repeat the chest X-ray because sometimes there's a, a, a X-ray deterioration before the clinical deterioration. And similar, similarly happens with the oxygen saturation. We see patients that really tolerate very well the lack of oxygen. You can see a patient with a good uh, respiratory situation, but the oxygen saturation drops to 85%. I mean, it's, a, it, it's surprising how this happened in patients with COVID-19. And the electrocardiogram, our cardiologists insisted that we repeated them 
every two, three days, especially if the patients uh, were taking drugs that prolong a QT inter interval for the risk of, uh, of uh, malignant arrhythmias. This is just an example of a chest X-ray, uh, the typical evolution of a chest X-ray. This is a patient that was actually going, doing uh, better. We see how the infiltrates, the peripheral infiltrates tend to form consolidates uh, and, uh, in the following days. And these uh, findings can last for weeks after, after discharge even. So uh, for medical and, and, and oxygen supply, for medical uh, management of COVID-19 patients, if someone was hoping to uh, get like a clear statement, a clear algorithm or what should be done, I am sorry, but this is not the case because as you uh, very well know, there is very, very little evidence-based recommendations for uh, medical therapy in COVID-19 patients. So what we did is basically what we could. We give patients treatments, most of them based in in vitro observations or in observational weak observational studies. So this, uh, what I'm going to show you, is the recommendations we gave in our hospital, updated to the last uh, changes uh, that have been performed in the last week. But again, it is very important, as I, as I say here, uh, the evidence is very weak for some drugs, and there is no evidence for most drugs uh, coming from cl controlled clinical trials. And the priority should always be referring patients to clinical tri trials instead of using an unappro unapproved drugs. This is the, uh, the um, optimal, but this is not the reality. The reality is that uh, we use uh, drugs in most patients out of the clinical trials. Uh, and that's why it's very important to uh, inform the patients of uh, the drugs we're going to use and, and that there is no uh, efficacy proven. Uh, the primum non nocere uh, uh, principle should uh, always remain. First, do no harm. Evaluate, really assess the risk in each patient before giving the drug, and as I said, giving an informed consent. So basically this slide that has appeared uh, in many uh, uh, present, appears uh, in many presentations um, basically resumes what we know of the evolution of the disease. We know that there is a first stage where there is an increase uh, uh, in a viral response, an uh, multiplication of the virus, and then we enter in this uh, second stage, the pulmonary phase, that is characterized, that it is characterized by an inflammatory response that if it continues, it uh, puts the patient in a third phase characterized mainly by a hyper, hyper, hyper inflammatory response. Not all patients are going to enter in the stage two or three, but uh, those who do are the ones who are going to need probably a more aggressive treatment. So the patient, uh, the uh, treatments in the phase two and three are basically targeted uh, to uh, decrease this inflammatory response. That's where we, we, we've, we've used corticosteroids inhibitors of interleukin-6, inhibitors of interleukin-2, JAK inhibitors, all these drugs have been used in this inflammatory response phase. So these were the algorithms, algorithms we use in our hospital. Um, uh, for patients with uh, clinical features and a PCR positive, but with no findings of pneumonia, uh, what we did is if, this, uh, if the symptoms were uh, mild or the patient had no comorbidities, we um, um, recommended symptomatic treatment and monitoring and no, uh, giving no drug to the patient. And for those patients older than 60 with comorbidities, we recommended considering the use of hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, um, plus uh, lopinavir with ritonavir or hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. Uh, again, now we know from the very recent findings of uh, different observational studies that probably hydroxychloroquine is not recommended and we are actually taking it out of this uh, algorithm, but this has been the recommendation uh, until a few days in our hospital. This is what we did in patients uh, in the outpatient setting. No treatment for mild cases with no pneumonia and considering a treatment with hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir ritonavir in patients with comorbidities or um, older than 60 years old. What did we recommend for patients with pneumonia? For patients with pneumonia, in those younger than 65, 65 years with no comorbidities and no criteria of severity, and for this we use the, any of the uh, um, tools for assessment of uh, uh, risk of severity, like the CURVE 65 score, we recommended lopinavir, ritonavir with 
uh, plus hydroxychloroquine. This in patients with no criteria of severity and no comorbidities. For patients with comorbidities and criteria of severity or criteria of severity, we used uh, the combination of lopinavir, ritonavir, or azithromycin, not together in combination because of the risk of QT prolongation, plus hydroxychloroquine. And in the beginning, we also used inter interferon, but we had to stop using it because uh, the, um, we, we had no availability of the drug. But probably the drugs where we find, uh, at least in the hospital setting, we, we, we find more uh, better results, maybe, are the ones we used in the inflammatory phase in patients with respiratory distress. And these are remdesivir, which has been available only, only a few weeks, uh, bef I mean, uh, in the last few weeks. So in the beginning, we didn't use it. Now we are using remdesivir. Uh, or tocilizumab, which is the one we used in the beginning of the pandemic, and uh, corticosteroid pulses in those patients with an inflammatory um, response. Again, no evidence for what we did in all of these uh, cases. When, we di when, when did we consider tocilizumab? Uh, when the patient had interstitial pneumonia with severe respiratory failure, and there was a rapid respiratory worsening with progressive uh, increase in the demand of, uh, of oxygen supply, and the patient had criteria of uh, inflammation, systemic inflammatory response, like in elevated levels of interleukin-6, elevated D-dimer, or progressive elevation of D-dimer levels. Uh, of course, we have to bear in mind all of the contraindications of tocilizumab. And the other drug we use uh, very commonly in the beginning of the pandemic was pulse of asteroids. Uh, Again, in very similar conditions that those where we use tocilizumab. What we did is patients with respiratory distress and inf markers of inflammation like D-dimer, ferritin, um, C-reactive protein. In those patients, we recommended pulses of asteroids. And in our hospital, we use methylprednisolones, 250 milligrams for three days, or dexamethasones, 40 milligrams intravenous for four days. This is the recommendation we did for the use of corticosteroids in our patients. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, different drugs that we used uh, in the treatment of COVID-19 and the dosing and the, uh, um, the duration of the treatment. This is basically uh, based on the information in the uh, drug sheet. So it's uh, um, available. We didn't did uh, anything outside of the recommendation for other diseases. Um, and for, uh, for the oxygen supply in, in, in patients, this is where I think uh, the, um, there is more evidence. We, we, were, we based in uh, considerations from other forms of uh, respiratory distress. Uh, first of all, in a situation of hypoxemic respiratory failure, we use oxygen therapy with nasal cannula with, uh, to maintain oxygen saturation uh, higher than 93%. Uh, if the clinical course was bad in that case, then we recommended uh, upgrading to oxygen therapy with non-rebreather mask, mask with a minimum of 10 to 15 liters per minute, or at this stage, even considering ICU. But the reality in the situation of a pandemic that this was not possible. A patient who was scaled from oxygen, from a nasal cannula to non-rebreather was not considered for ICU because basically we had no beds for ICU for these patients. We reserved ICU for patients who required endotracheal intubation. So from oxygen nasal cannula, we moved to non-rebreather mask. And with the, if with the non-rebreather, the patient still has having a poor clinical course, then the patient was considered for ICU admission. But still at this point, many patients could not be admitted in the ICU because imagine the situation we had at some point, uh, 1,200 patients admitted in the medical ward and only 110 beds of ICU, all of them were busy. So if the patient has ICU criteria, but there were no ICU beds available or the patient was no candidate for ICU, the next step was using high-flow oxygen therapy through nasal cannula. If this was not available because at some point all of them were in use by other patients, we had uh, dozens of high-flow oxygen therapy, but still at some point they were all in use. So we considered CPAP systems with oxygen, the like Businac type, um, and we had to invent systems temporarily until we had the opportunity to 
do endotracheal intubation for these patients. We use systems like this, pneumologists in our hospital uh, using uh, decathlon masks uh, uh, connected to two uh, connections of oxygen. They created this system like a temporary measure before doing endotracheal intubation. Again, in this case, this is not a recommendation. This is not something we are actually proud of. This is what we did in times of war. This is what we have. So before the patient was considered uh, for endotracheal intubation or for those patients who were not uh, candidates for ICU, we had to invent these kinds of systems. Um, and uh, finally, for BTE prophylaxis, I am uh, very uh, happy with the presentation of, of Professor uh, Gero Chiafas. We basically uh, uh, summarize all the information we had so far. Um, we have to say that, uh, as, as uh, it has been well stated, that some of the observational studies have suggested that there's a higher incidence of BTE in, in COVID-19, especially in the ICU setting. But this is very important to remark the risk of bleeding in this patient has not been evaluated. There is 20,000 papers in, COVID, in PubMed so far, none of them to evaluate the risk of bleeding in COVID-19. We are conducting a, a study, the, the members of the Rieta Registry where, that I belong to, along with Manuel Monreal from, from Barcelona. We are uh, running a study called the Riete Bleeding Study for COVID-19 patients. It's still not uh, published. We are analyzing the, starting to analyze data this week. But the preliminary information we have is COVID-19 patients bleed, especially in the ICU setting. They bleed probably more than non-COVID-19 patients. So this is something that we need to uh, bear in mind when we recommend uh, higher than prophylaxis doses uh, for patients with COVID-19. We don't know. I mean, we know that probably patients with a higher risk of thrombosis are those with a higher risk of bleeding. And my personal opinion, because this was a, a very uh, a common uh, cause for discussion in Spain and in my hospital, d diamond levels should not guide the dosing of prophylaxis. We should use clinical parameters, but not d dimer because d dimer basically, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know how to state it, but d dimer levels go crazy in patients with COVID-19. We know it's associated with a poor prognosis, but in some patients with mild form of the disease, D-dimer goes absolutely crazy. We lose it as a tool for BT diagnosis because it's elevated in many patients and, and we don't know exactly what that uh, means uh, um, when we are talking about risk of venous thromboembolism. Of course, for all pa patients with a previous indication for anticoagulation, we recommended a, a switching, uh, admit, at least during hospital admission, to low molecular weight heparin, especially to avoid interaction with other drugs. And we performed a study in our center, evaluated the incidence, the incidence of asymptomatic deep vein thrombosis in patients with COVID-19 uh, in the medical world. And we find that the levels of asymptomatic DBT are high, but not higher than those seen in other acute medical patients. So um, this is a finding in, in 160 patients in our study. So this is the, um, the um, uh, prophylactic BT dose we recommended. It's basically uh, the standard uh, doses, for all patients, unless contraindicated, uh, bemiparin 300 and 3,500 uh, 3, units a day or 4,000 units in the case of enoxaparin. And as an alternative, we had fondaparin also patients with a uh, um, contraindication to low molecular weight heparin. In case of renal failure, adjusted dose according to, to the drug sheet. And uh, this is uh, the only um, situation where in my hospital we recommended different doses. In patients with obesity, with a VMI higher than 35, or patients in the ICU setting, or patients with a previous BTE event who were not uh, uh, anticoagulated at, at that moment, we recommended a little bit higher uh, dose of uh, low molecular weight heparin, 60 milligrams daily, or 6,000 units in the case of phenoxaparin, or 5,000 units in the case of uh, vemiparin, which are the heparins we use in my hospital. And at hospital discharge, we recommended for patients with immobilization, immobilization at home or other risk factor for BTE, we recommended extending prophylaxis for 7 to 14 uh, days. Um, and uh, to, to, uh, uh, to finish, yeah, uh, just the one slide. Uh, what we do at discharge for patients with negative PCR, they were sent home, basically. And patients with positive PCR, we have three options. Sending them to a nursing home till they were negative. 
sending them to a medicalized hospital so they were observed until, until they could be sent home, or sending them home if there was a, a possibility of doing isolation at their uh, home and uh, safely from their relatives. Uh, so these are the conclusions. And uh, my uh, only uh, hope, my only recommendation for those countries who have not suffered this uh, crazy wave, this crazy crisis of, of coronavirus, is that I hope this disinformation is not useful for you. It's only uh, to learn and to uh, know a little bit more, but I hope you never need to use this information because it's really, really been a, a few crazy months and I don't recommend this to anyone. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Damelo Rodriguez. It was a, a great pleasure to listen to you because you covered very exhaustively a very difficult uh, uh, chapter of the COVID uh, management. And I think that all the information that you provided will be very useful for the countries that did not experience because the, your experience from, uh, from Spain is very didactic. So I move rapidly to Professor Jerome Levy. Welcome and thank you very much for being with us today. It's a great honor because uh, Professor Levy is uh, one of the leaders in uh, DIC and the Intensive Care Unit Management of Patients with Coagulopathies. So he will uh, uh, present the algorithm for the management of the COVID patients in ICU. Uh, and I will look he uh, hear him and look his slides with a very great attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's see, share my screen. Excellent. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Um, a privilege to be part of this international um, symposium um, and uh, to discuss, uh, as I've been requested, the algorithms for the management of COVID-19 in the intensive care unit and a focus on coagulopathy. Uh, it's a privilege to do international types of meetings. Uh, pour moi, c'est un grand plaisir pour uh, discuter ça avec tous mes collègues partout dans le monde. Um, también los gentes en España y todos los uh, países uh, español. And one final comment is Yasu, Tikanes, Calasto, and thanks for the opportunity. That being said, the rest is going to be in English. So apologies. So um, no particular disclosures related to this. But um, my learning objectives are to describe some of the unique aspects of ICU patient, review specific ICU algorithms, and remember, as the previous speaker emphasized, that a lot of guidance, guidelines, documents are not always based on great data, and we continue to evolve in our understanding. And what I want to do is really talk a little about the anticoagulation and a little of the perspective of... Um, thromboinflammation, and particularly for sepsis, what we've known in the past, and I think just the sheer magnitude of all the patients we're seeing really presents a unique paradigm for us. Um, and again, appreciate all the previous speakers' perspectives. This is a, an interesting case that I want to start out with. Um, when I came on service about three weeks ago, and I'm finally now discharging this patient, a 60 four-year-old gentleman had cold miners, lung injury, pneumoconiosis. He had a bilateral lung transplant and actually was on VA ECMO, pretty critically ill. Did well despite a long, prolonged course, but bounced back to the intensive care unit on the 17th of May. He had acute respiratory failure, ARDS. His x-ray showed ground glass appearance, pretty impressive, um, and required reintubation. Now, uh, we sent a coagulation testing on them, a DIC screen. And I send frequent DIC screens ages before COVID-19. His fibrinogen was 800 milligrams per deciliter, or eight grams per liter. D-dimers were 5,500 nanograms per mil or 5.5 mics per, per mil. His platelets were uh, pretty normal, 220,000. INR was 1.2. And his white count was about 8,300. On x-ray, again, very characteristic interstitial edema, but the echo was normal, no acute RV strain issues. He was reintubated for acute respiratory failure. He had acute renal failure. And in our scenario with acute renal failure, we use unfractionated heparin. Um, interestingly, 
this was the characteristic signature, as I'll show you from Marco Renucci's paper in J Journal Thrombosimostasis, but the patient came back with mycoplasma. Interesting point, though, is that this is a type of scenario we've seen for many, many years with acute infection. And I think part of the question, and I'm going to repeat this throughout my presentation, is understanding the timestamp for ICU critical illness um, and COVID-19. This slide, I think, is a really important slide. And it talks really and addresses the timestamp on acute uh, thromboinflammation, what's also called immunohemostasis during acute infection. This is from um, uh, Dr. De La Branche's work, uh, as well as um, uh, some of the other additional work that's come out of their important group on VTE and thrombosis. But the important point of this particular slide is in the acute response to infection is this adaptive hemostasis, hyperfibrinogenemia, uh, again, trying to lay down fibrinogen, clot, and other issues to uh, attenuate the infectious disease. The other important point is that we've heard a lot about critical illness. Um, the previous speaker really focused on the ICU perspective, but it's just a few important paradigms when we talk about ICU patients. ICU patients, remember, are often critically ill with acute on chronic issues. Again, the chronic perspective um, was that they were already had borderline multi-organ dysfunction. They're often on mechanical ventilation, thus the risk for ventilator-associated pneumonia. Remember the hemodynamic effects of positive pressure ventilation. And remember, these patients have multiple vascular access sites, central lines, especially uh, arterial and venous, and, and a risk for catheter uh, or central line-associated blood infections, what's called CLABSI. They're immobile. So they're at risk for infections. Therapies need to be IV. And one of the things I want to remind everybody is that when we talk about coagulation changes in COVID-19, the question always is the timestamp. When was this diagnosed? Because remember that co-infections are common. We reports up to about half of our patients in COVID-19 in the ICU developing a secondary infection. And I think part of the coagulopathy that we've seen evolves to a potential um, overt DIC because of the fact that you have a secondary infection and obviously multi-organ failure. Just a quick commentary just to show you the burden of the thrombotic issues. Um, and Clock and others have shown this in some more recent studies that in, in their particular discussion of 184 ICU patients, 31% composite thromboembolic uh, based on complications based on imaging, VTE 27%, arterial thrombotic events in 3.7% with pulmonary emboli most frequent. And that occurs in theirs, uh, there was 25 patients, but in some of their other reports as high as perhaps 20% of their ICU patients. So again, the critically ill patients are at that last step. That's why they're admitted to the ICU. And as again, we heard from the previous speaker, you know, you have to be pretty sick to be admitted. And I think that's the essence of some of the Chinese initial data. One just quick comment of, uh, in Marco Renucci's study, we wrote the editorial, Gene Connors and I, on, and actually we're the first to discuss the concept or introduce thromboinflammation. I think this is a really interesting study because one of the first studies of patients looking prospectively at the ICU, 10 patients were followed uh, with profoundly procoagulant admission. D-dimers were 5.5 mics per mil, just like the patient I presented. Fibrinogen uh, median values were about 800 milligrams per deciliter, but they correlated the fibrinogen with interleukin-6 levels. Um, and interestingly, after increasing anticoagulation, D-dimers um, and other viscoelastic and hypercoagulability parameters improve. But I think a very interesting study in one of our earlier prospective analyses. Now what I'm gonna do per request is go through a few ICU anticoagulation algorithms. In the recent review article that um, Gene Connors and I published in Blood, uh, which uh, came out about a month ago, but now in print form a few days ago, Basically, um, focusing on the ICU patients here, clearly everybody needs standard venous thromboembolic prophylaxis. But the real question that comes up is that if you are now admitted to the ICU, 
in the current era, should you really have some escalated dose VTE prophylaxis, i.e. weight adjusted from the previous speakers suggested more fixed doses, we believe more in weight doses. And I think perhaps um, our patients are mas grande patients in, in Spain, but we have some very large patients and weight adjustment is important. And especially perhaps if you have acute lung injury in ARDS. But if there is obviously clear confirmed clot, then there's no doubt about the importance of therapeutic doses and anticoagulation. Let me go through our current Duke guidance document for, the, for patients. Patients in the ICU or other critically ill patients with D-dimers at five times upper limit the normal or 2.5 mics per mil. Clearly, um, and this is again in patients confirmed with COVID-19 um, who have no known overt venous thromboembolic or cath thrombosis. Clearly what um, um, our colleagues recommend, and, and my hematology group here is a, a, a non-malignant hematologic group with incredible expertise and, and a great collaborative group of, of individuals. But their suggestion, and this is based on, on, on um, again, from our hematologic group, enoxaparin 0.5 milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours. Again, remember ICU or high D-dimers, but if you have acute renal failure, unlike uh, my colleagues in Spain, we go to unfractionated heparin um, with a target level using an anti-10A level of 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. And remember, a lot of institutions have moved to the actual anti-10A level monitoring versus um, using PTT because of all the issues and with the hyperfibrinogenemia. Patients at high risk for bleeding um, or other contraindications like thrombocytopenia less than 25,000 or active bleeding, as I think was mentioned previously, then those are the patients who would be uh, use mechanical prophylaxis. In all of our patients, DIC screening, daily creatinine, and CBC. Now, in the more critically ill high-risk patients, confirmed uh, COVID-19 clearly, but with a documented thromboembolic issue, and including acute PE, progressive multi-organ system failure, or other real concerns of microvascular thrombosis, then using full systemic doses in oxaparin, one milligram per kilogram Q12, or again with acute renal failure using unfractionated heparin, but with the higher target level of 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 or 0 0.8. Um, and then additional perhaps imaging, but again, uh, one of the things that the incredible extensive use, and especially in my cardiothoracic ICU of, of acute echo monitoring, the cardiology or the medical literature always talks about RV strain, but I mean, you can quickly get an image of RV, um, an RV view with dilated akinetic or hypo, hypervolemic RV with acute dysfunction, and again, high suspicion for PE with full systemic dosing. And again, I think monitoring DI screen initially on admission and then at subsequent time intervals is important. Jean Connors thoughtfully gave me her dosing strategy for the Harvard system. She runs uh, not only the oncologic anticoagulation, but worked closely with all the critical care people um, in the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And, and again, thanks for her perspective, is that um, based on uh, standard dosing, but focusing on the more critically ill patient population, it's very similar to what we do at Duke in terms of anoxaparin. Um, with low, high body weight, but also if you have renal dysfunction, creatinine clearance less than 30, using uh, unfractionated heparin. Uh, the, the, the interesting question is um, there are uh, no, I think, real comparative studies. I think the future will hopefully uh, help us explain that. But the benefit of not having to titrate frequent blood sampling really makes the idea of low molecular weight heparin far more appealing in our COVID-19 patients. The CHESS guidelines also recently came out about a week ago. And I'm not sure that really um, there is that much. It's more of a generality of what to use and how to manage. Um, and again, clearly if you have pulmonary emboli, you need to think about systemic dosing. Um, they recommend against the use of any advanced therapies such as systemic thrombolysis for most patients 
uh, with confirmed thromboembolic complications. Again, um, a lot of generalities, but nothing really specific uh, that really offers us, I think, additional understanding. But again, um, I think all of these consensus documents are pretty consistent. A few important points to sort of sum up here. Remember, I wanna emphasize that in a lot of our patients in the ICU, there is the ubiquity extensive number of secondary infection with the potential for DIC or what we call sepsis-induced coagulopathy. There is a growing database that's suggesting up to 50% of patients who come in uh, in the ICU may have a secondary infection. And again, they're intubated, ventilated, ventilator-associated pneumonia, uh, a very common finding. So I think part of the question always is that when you look at these D-dimers and all the other coagulation testing, is that where are you in the hospital course? Because the evolution clearly is in more of a consumptive coagulopathy. And I think it's critical understanding how far you are into the hospital course. Just to remember that um, up until COVID-19, half of all, at least half of all the DIC scenarios we saw were due to bacterial, viral, or fungal septicemia. Although a variety of other therapies can produce this, including post-resuscitation cardiac arrest, where we see D-dimers as levels 100,000, aortic rupture, and other scenarios, acute shock liver, and all of the sequelae of profound hypotension uh, as severe organ injury and um, traumatic-induced coagulopathy. Just remember that in the literature, sepsis-induced coagulopathy is really a cinnamon, cin cinnamon, synonym for disseminated intravascular coagulopathy or DIC. And I think one of the really uh, important perspectives from all the previous speakers is that the COVID-19 therapeutic strategies, I think, are focused on three major perspectives. And this is actually the NIH, NHLBI idea of moving forward with clinical trials that have three major components. One, some antiviral therapy, two, anticoagulation and thrombin modulation, and then three, the anti-inflammatory immunomodulatory agent. Again, the concept of multiplicity of therapeutic interventions is really important. And that's really the future, I think, of a, a advanced clinical trials will be. Interested in many years in DIC and multiple therapies, one of the interesting things is the repletion of serine protease inhibitors, specifically antithrombin, recombinant thrombomodulin, thrombomodulin, and there have been very large studies that have addressed this. Initially, as we've all seen, antithrombin levels are actually relatively normal, but with secondary infections, patients often get an overt DIC. The data on the use of antithrombin and recombinant thrombomodulin is interesting. The problem is a lot of the studies have not focused on the coagulopathic DIC patients. With large meta-analyses that have actually examined this, the problem is that of the 2,300 patients studied in antithrombin analyses uh, and randomized studies, only uh, maybe 10% were had confirmed DIC and coagulopathy. And from the KyberSEP study almost 20 years ago, analyzing the subpopulation with DIC benefited from antithrombin, um, but that's a whole interesting separate story. Interestingly, regarding recombinant thrombomodulin, again, um, sub-analyses of these large databases show improved outcomes, again, with anticoagulation, a common finding for both any kind of DIC or sepsis-induced coagulopathy. Remember, um, in DIC, the previous spoke speaker spoke about bleeding, critical, important perspective, especially with full-dose anticoagulation. But for a long time, um, and from the DIC literature, Gando and others have really reported the concept that there are different phenotypes of DIC. There's a bleeding phenotype, but there's a well-established hypercoagulable phenotype, which I think is part of some of the scenarios that we are seeing clinically with secondary infections. Just as sort of interestingly, seven years ago, um, there was a rash in the United States of what was called a flesh-eating bacteria producing 
uh, necrosis of limbs and people were losing their limbs. Um, Richard Hodgkiss, who was an ICU fellow with me many years ago at Mass General, did a, the original work on apoptosis and sepsis and very active in immunomodulation and amplification. Marcel Levy, myself, actually wrote a little a commentary seven years ago about some of the patients who have these sort of symmetrical peripheral gangrene have sepsis-induced hypercoagulability with peripheral ischemia, clearly certain bacteria like clostridia and beta hemolytic strep. And those are the people that need to be anticoagulation beyond source control and antibiotics. One of the problems that we have, and I think why we're seeing such an odd paradigm of COVID-19, is an infectious-induced endotoxin bacterial um, gram negatives. We treat antibiotics, and critical is early intervention to improve both mortality and morbidity. We don't do that with COVID-19, and, and I think we're going to still be in an odd scenario until we get better antivirals. Finally, an interesting spin is that um, a group of us looked at some of the ischemic limb necrosis and septic shock because you will start to see this, I think, with some of the advanced DIC patients and the hypercoagulability phenomenon. It's often been blamed on vasopressors, but we did a very interesting analysis of all of the reports and studies. And basically, and did this with uh, a variety of members of the journal thrombosis, critical care, and other groups. The bottom line is that um, if you lose your limbs and you have ischemic necrosis, you either have a profound DIC state, shock liver, or a combination of the both, since this is the major cause for acrocyanosis and symmetrical peripheral gangrene. So in summary, remember ICU patients are critically ill and at high risk for thromboembolic phenomena, including PEs, as we've seen from the literature. Um, I think many speakers have talked about risk versus benefit for anticoagulation need to be considered. But I think with loss of your endothelial function, the hypercoagulability, anticoagulation is critical. And monitoring is really part of that. I think it's very important. Um, and targeting, especially with unfractionated heparin, uh, anti-10A levels is a useful adjunct um, if you have questions about PTT monitoring. An unresolved question is which one's better? You know, there's all the complexity of heparin. Remember, heparin is stored in mast cells. It comprises about 10% of the mast cell by weight. Mast cells are very important in immunomodulation and the release of heparin and all the things heparin does, I think uh, may be an important part of it. And remember with all the thromboinflammation endothelial injury as a major issue, critical role of anticoagulation, but also treating the underlying infection and the immunomodulatory perspective will all see hopefully evolve over time. A privilege to be part of this uh, collective consciousness. Thank you all so very much. Thank you very much, for Professor Levy. It was a great pleasure to have this overview on the hypercoagulability. So the discussion will be at the end because I have a lot of questions. Uh, and now I pass to Professor Marc Garnier, who is a, a colleague of us. He is uh, working in the Department of Anesthesiology in uh, the St. Antoine uh, University Hospital. And uh, he is a professor of anesthesiology here, and he will, uh, he's responsible for the reduction of the guidelines of uh, uh, Society of Anesthesiology in France uh, for the management of the COVID patients. So he will pre present our uh, the French algorithms. Thank you, thank you very much. <coughs> yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Grigori, for the invitation to uh, to this uh, webinar. I'm trying to share my screen. Good evening, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm Marc Garnier, an anesthesiologist and intensivist, uh, working uh, in the operating theater and in ICU in Tenon and Saint Antoine hospitals in Paris. Uh, I'm glad to present several algorithms dealing with the perioperative management of COVID-19 patients to our colleague out of France and to share with you our experience on the field. These algorithms came from the National French Guidelines on Anesthetic and Perioperative Management in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that contains about 60 recommendations that have just been published in the journal Anesthesia, Critical Care, and Pen Medicine. First, let's start with a few words about the current COVID-19 context. 
uh, everybody is aware about the COVID-19 pandemic that started at the end of uh, 2019 in China and then spread worldwide. The pandemic reached uh, Europe at the beginning of uh, March uh, 2020, first in Italy and then in France and in nearly all the other European countries. Then the SARS-CoV-2 virus spread in the other continents, notably in America and in, in uh, Southwest Asia. But when looking at the geographic distribution of COVID-19 cases uh, worldwide, uh, we can see that uh, SARS-CoV-2 spread all around the world. At this time, about 7 million of patients had suffered from COVID-19 with a proven positive diagnosis made by PCR. The current feeling of physicians and more generally of people from Western Europe and I guess from the United States is that the worst is behind us and we can see a huge reduction of new COVID-19 patients. However, this situation in Western countries that were among the first regions affected when the pandemic spread out of China to the rest of the world must not hide that the situation is very heterogeneous across the world and that in fact the number of new confirmed cases in the world is not decreasing and is on the contrary still increasing with, for instance, more than 130,000 new cases 48 hours ago. Indeed, the new epicenters of the pandemic are now South America, in particular in Brazil and Chile, and Russia, where the 14-day cumulative number of reported COVID-19 cases is now exceeding 200 per 100,000 inhabitants. However, the situation in Europe is not totally under control. You can see on the figure at the bottom of the slide that since approximately three weeks, the number of cases is more stable than decreasing. This crude prevalence hides discrepancy between, between countries, as you can see in the figure on the top of the slide. Indeed, in several countries, uh, there is no new cases for several weeks, such as in Austria, Luxembourg, or Iceland, for instance. But in other countries, such as Poland, Portugal, Romania, or Sweden, there is still a stable number of new cases with a curve that uh, looks like a plateau rather than a gradually decreasing curve. Consequently, considering the global situation in Europe as in the rest of the world, to date, caution is still advised and the recommendation and additional precaution advocated by health authorities and learned societies are still relevant, in particular in the perioperative context. I'm now going to introduce you three major recommendations and algorithms dealing with the perioperative management of patients in this context. First, a few words about the great interest of a preoperative regulation of patient scheduling. Indeed, in many countries, current activity in the operating theater cannot be at the same level as it was at the beginning of the year. This is due to multiple factors, such as remaining conversion of classical hospital beds into ICU beds, uh, anesthetic drugs shortage, or a lack of health workforce once the many reinforcements that had come to help with patients' management at the peak of the epidemic had returned into their hospital of origin. And even we see uh, some patients uh, who had feared to come back to be operated in an hospital where COVID-19 patients are still hospitalized. Thus, the resumption of surgical activity will be gradual and spread over time. This imposes a strict regulation of the surgical activity in order to optimize both patient care and the functioning of the structure. This aims to care the patients, and in particular the patient whose surgical treatment was postponed during the peak of the pandemic, in order to avoid a loss of individual chance, but also to avoid a loss of collective chance, that is to say uh, with the objective of treating as many patients as possible in the best possible way at a time when we cannot yet treat everyone equally. So for this purpose, we suggest setting up in each hospital a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary surgical activity regulation committee, including at least one anesthesiologist, one surgeon and one operating theater regulator. This regulatory committee will meet weekly and be in charge of making decisions on the production of a restricted operating schedule. To achieve this mission, the committee must interact with many partners and take into account notably the recommendations from the local health agency on the prioritization of intervention to be scheduled, the list of previously cancelled and postponed cases by specialty and ward, and then 
the evaluation on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on whether the patients have reached the tolerance limits of a disease, either by disease progression or by the risk of decompensation or pain. In addition, the patient rescheduling should take into account the presence of risk factors for increased susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2 infection and severity. In order to estimate their viral risk and to assess the risk benefits balance of a surgery at the considering moment, in particular in immunocompromised or hematological patients. Then uh, the committee has to take into account the hard availability of post-operative resources, both in critical and non-critical wards so as not to saturate hospitalization capacities. The identification of essential health professional and medical device representative by procedure is also uh, uh, one key point. To put into perspective with the ability of the medical staff, nurses, and more globally of all, all healthcare providers working in the operating theater. And finally, the committee has to take into account the state of drug stocks, while several molecules are experiencing supply shortages, the states of blood product stocks by collection of blood from donors has considerably been impacted by the lockdown and now by the progressive decontainment, the state of the medical supply stock while the consumption of many supplies uh, such as heat moisture exchange filters or closed suction system has dramatically increased in ICU in the former weeks, and finally, the state of medical device condition and availability. To that, the committee must have close contacts with the local pharmacy, blood delivery agency, purchasing department of the hospital and bioengineering department. At the end, the surgical program will be made each week by taking into account constraints and possible temporary restriction on this or that anesthetic drug or this or that device, leading, for instance, to give priority to surgery that can be performed under local regional anesthesia in one week, and those that do not require plan in intraoperative transfusion on the other week. Then, let's talk about the preoperative COVID-19 diagnostic strategy as uh, recommended by our society. As I mentioned in my introduction, the SARS-CoV-2 is still circulating in the population of many countries. This should be taken into account as data regarding the prognosis of patient undergoing surgery, surgery with a perioperative SARS-CoV-2 infection has recently been published. In this study from the Lancet, the perioperative mortality has reached 30 to 40 percent in patients older than 70 years operated from major or emergent surgery and 15 to 20 percent for minor elective procedures, which is far above the usual outcome. In younger patients, 30-day mortality was up to 25% for emergency major surgery. Subgroup analysis uh, showed that age, male sex, high hazard grade, and oncological and major surgery were particularly at risk of postoperative morbid mortality. Consequently, avoiding operating on a patient with COVID, especially in the most in these most uh, vulnerable subgroups, is of great importance. The first step is to, to determine if a patient presents clinical signs of COVID. Indeed, we believe that a preoperative screening strategy with a systematic PCR for all is not relevant. First, uh, it can lead to overwhelm the global capacity of performing PCR if it is performed in both medical patients with clinical suspicion of COVID and in all the surgical patients before the surgery. Secondly, Performing a PCR in the whole surgical population would lead to decrease the positive predictive value of the test, as the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 positivity in this whole population would be much lower than in the subgroup of symptomatic patients. To this hand, checking for symptoms is recommended during the pre-anesthetic consultation and a second time during the pre-anesthetic visit just before the surgery, and better using a standardized questionnaire. Indeed, the use of such a questionnaire increases the completeness of the symptom collection and the reproducibility of the medical examination. We propose such a questionnaire distinguishing between major and minor symptoms designed to look for the most uh, frequent COVID symptoms such as fever or dry cough and the most evocative ones such as uh, anosmia without uh, declining all the unusual symptoms that have been reported in the literature. 
In addition, uh, a close contact within the last 15 days with a person with a confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection is also sought, as it is a major risk factor for COVID. Then, in the case of high suspicion of COVID-19, defined as the presence of one major signs and or at least two minor signs, it seems reasonable to postpone the intervention for 24 to 48 hours to obtain the results of a SARS-CoV-2 PCR performed on a nasopharyngeal swab. If a PCR is positive, COVID-19 infection requires postponing the intervention until patient recovery which is set in France for a period of at least 14 days after symptom onset, extended to at least 24 days in immunocompromised patients or patients with a severe form of COVID-19 in whom clearance of the virus may be longer. At the end of this postponement period, the patient returns to the first line of the algorithm, recollection of the nasopharyngeal swab if symptoms persist, or in the absence of symptoms in the case of surgery at risk. If the PCR is negative and taking into account the existence of false negative results, if the clinical presentation is evocative, especially if it is reinforced by characteristic paraclinical signs such as lymphopenia, eosinopenia, or elevated C-reactive protein, it should be considered that the patient has a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And then the diagnostic probability may be reinforced, especially in the case of major surgery at risk. Uh, by either a thoracic CT scan or control of a PCR in a single sample and or a serology, but in this uh, for, for serology only if, if the symptom has been present for at least seven to ten days. If the patient presents with sign compatible with a SARS-CoV-2 infection, but, but the PCR is negative, the evocative paraclinical signs are absent. The CT scan shows no sign of SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia, and the serology is negative. A differential diagnosis is then the most likely, and the intervention will be postponed until this other pathology has recovered. In a patient with a low suspicion, meaning only one minor symptom, the presence of a close contact in the past 15 days with a person with suspected or proven SARS-CoV-2 infection increases the likelihood that the patient has a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Then, his or her management becomes similar to that of the patient with a more suggestive clinical presentation. Similarly, the presence of risk factor for a severe form of COVID-19 in a post-symptomatic patient encourages further cooperative investigations to confirm or deny the diagnosis of COVID. Finally, in a completely asymptomatic patient, a distinction should be made between first surgery with opening or exposure of the airway, such as ear, nose, throat surgery, thoracic surgery, or route surgery, etc., for which there is a significant risk of aerosolization of the virus for the operating room staff, then motivating the realization of PCR even in an asymptomatic patient as long as the virus is circulating in the population. And secondly, surgery for which a SARS-CoV-2 infection could have serious postoperative consequences, thus motivating, motivating PCR testing. Uh, this surgery can probably be summed up as major surgery, like uh, open, heart, open heart surgery, major abdominal or pelvic surgery, or organ transplantation. Indeed, the frequent respiratory, uh, respiratory impact of this surgery justifies a more thorough diagnostic approach as the risk of synergy between SARS-CoV-2 and perioperative lung injury is now highly suspected. In these two situations, this PCR will ideally be performed in the 24 hours preceding the interventions in order to have an idea of a viral carriage as close as possible to the high-risk procedure while taking into account the time required to obtain the result in each hospital. Finally, in non-major surgery in asymptomatic patients, uh, the surgery can be performed without any screening test. Lastly, a few reflections about the perioperative pathway in the COVID-19 context. Once the indication of surgery has been confirmed and scheduled, we strongly suggest that a dedicated COVID pathway be put in place in each facility due to the infectiousness of COVID-19 patients. This pathway must start in the surgery ward and then includes the operative theater, the recovery room, the intensive care unit if necessary, and then go back to the ward. Depending on the actual incidence of COVID at a given time in each country and region, this pathway may be declined in two different ways, 
Even that the incidence of new cases remains high, this pathway must coexist with the conventional non-COVID pathway. On the contrary, if surgeries in COVID-positive or highly suspected patients has become anecdotal in your hospital, the conventional pathway may be the only circuit used routinely, while the specific pathway will only be deployed in case of emergent or non-deferrable surgery in a patient with proven or suspected COVID. In this later case, the specific CAF pathway cannot be improvised and must be anticipated and carefully prepared and then field tested. Anyway, this COVID-specific pathway must include at least the four following concepts. First, security, meaning that adequate protective measures are taken to protect healthcare workers and all the other patients. Secondly, identification of this pathway, notably by visible and uniform, and uniform signs warning the health worker of the presence of a COVID patient, in particular in the interventional room, in order to minimize the number of staff to the minimum required for the intervention. Thirdly, optimization of the pathway to isolate the COVID patients from others as much as possible using notably analysis of inflow and outflow of patients. This includes, for instance, the use of uh, dedicated elevators that will be cleaned up after the patient has been transported or a dedicated entrance into the operating room so as not to cross paths with other patients. And lastly, the identification of at least one operating room dedicated to the care of COVID patients using dedicated models and in which specific equipments required for anesthesia of the COVID patients are always available, such as fluid-resistant lung sleeve gown, disposable head cap, video laryngoscopy devices, or closed suction system, etc. Then it only remains for me to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark. Jaime, I was listening to you. I'm th I was wondering if uh, your uh, the recommendation that you presented should be uh, how you say adopted and then do and incorporated to the ensemble of the hospital or the or the countries that did not face uh, COVID. I think that you offer a great uh, service to these countries with this uh, lecture. Thank you. So we have to to create a network with them. And I know that uh, people from uh, from all the Balkan countries are attending the meeting, and we are in about about 800 persons who are connected now. So it is a uh, very important value these meetings. So I have uh, to move now to Dr. Economakis. Dr. Economakis uh, is uh, is from the world of uh, computer science and uh, he is working on artificial intelligence and the development of uh, of uh, softwares in the healthcare domain so he will uh, present uh, the new achievements in the telemedicine and the new technologies uh, which are emerging uh, during the covid uh, epidemic thank you very much for your invitation i know i'm the last one i would be very fast I will speed oh, up. No, you have time. We have time. Don't worry. So uh, I know that uh, most of you, you use a lot of uh, data in your uh, presentations, and uh, this is our primary job. So uh, a lot of you, you have uh, used um, previously uh, in your careers a lot of uh, CDS systems, which means for uh, clinical decision support systems. And uh, most of them, as you know, they, they require a lot of uh, data and a lot of processing in order to produce reliable outcomes. Uh, in, uh, we're dealing with healthcare for more than 15 years in analytics. And uh, all of us, we are strongly believe that uh, the more you know, the better you practice. So uh, how can you be, how, some, how uh, someone can be in a position to know more? Less than a year before we met with uh, Mr. Gerogiafas and Mr. Sergiopoulos and, and start exploring the idea of uh, developing a rapid deployment CDS tool based on uh, risk assessment models. Uh, 
So we started with uh, the Compass Cut methodology and the scope was to provide to healthcare professionals a tool that they can easily use on the field and uh, support them on uh, decision making. So what we have done is, is, is uh, to, to build a, a very user-friendly tool that uh, can uh, uh, someone build a da the data collection steps and sequences and then create the evaluation rules in order to deliver humanized results for decision making. So uh, what uh, we want to do is to very easily and fast put uh, methods uh, uh, in, in the system in order to be uh, as, as uh, fast in the market as we can. So uh, uh, what we provide is that uh, the data collection and the, it's a very easy process with zero training fast and reliable, so the professionals can very easily uh, conclude, the, have the, the, the results and the evaluation score in, uh, in real time, and uh, the, the system offers uh, a very humanized decision-making uh, recommendations. So, uh, as you see here with uh, Mr. Girojiafas, we have built uh, the, the first one, and the only thing that uh, you have to do is to answer uh, 15 questions in order to, uh, to have the full results of uh, the test, and then uh, the outcome is the recommendation treatment based on uh, the algorithm that we are using. Sa the same, we have done it with uh, COVID-19 risk factor, and uh, very fast, you can see that uh, we have the result. That means that uh, we are above 18, so that the, most probably the patient has uh, a high risk uh, uh, problem. So after that, what we want to do is that uh, we want to be able to, so build your uh, data collection, evaluate the rules, have delivered humanized results. D easy to collect your data, evaluate the score and have the decision in humanized uh, way. So this is it, 15 questions and the result uh, on the phone of the professional of the healthcare. So the same for the COVID-19 risk factor, the results, this is a high risk, uh, most probably patient. So next, what we have to do is to, to, to do the cycle a couple of times meaning collect the data from the patient treatment and, and, um, and of course the outcome, and then use all this high quality data in order to do uh, data analytics. So what was the need? The need is to, uh, to, to be able to uh, use the met methods without the deviation fast and reliable on the field. So we need the, the health, we want the health uh, professional to be able to use it uh, uh, like an extension of his hand. The need, uh, of course, to produce and evaluate the method results in real time without uh, min with a minimum effort and, uh, and collecting high quality data since they are based on, on uh, high quality algorithms and not, uh, they are not uh, just generic uh, data. So what are the benefits? Uh, we're going to, to, to use all this anonymous data collection in order to uh, tune up uh, uh, all the methods and the scorings and uh, increase the, uh, the accuracy in data collection and, uh, and, 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 and to, to, to give back to all the healthcare professionals uh, all this uh, information that most of the times are hardly and in a lot of systems uh, stored in order to, to use them again, again to do their work. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I hope that I was very fast in my <laughs> presentation. So thank you. Sometimes people with uh, from informatics have a little bit difficult to manage the computer. This is an encouraging message. Yes. <laughs> it's not only the doctors that they are. Uh, 
So uh, we have uh, we have time now for the questions. There are many questions from the audience. So I will start uh, uh, with a question which is coming from uh, from Russia, I suppose. Uh, and uh, the question is: uh, if if this hypercoagulable state, I, I imagine is uh, for Professor Levy, is the hypercoagulable state is uh, provoked by the virus? Or is the second inflammation wave that uh, activates the coagulation system? Meaning that if we eliminate the virus, the hypercoagulability will persist? So, <clears throat> any in acute infection causes this hypercoagulability state. Part of the problem with this particular virus is its cytotropic nature, where it then um, not only affects probably uh, multiple cellular issues, but it clearly causes an endotheliopathy, what's now called an endotheliolitis. This has been long been described with traumatic injury. Um, and what happens is, and you know, from some of the postmortem, you see capsaic staining, which means that it's lymphocyte, it's cellular apoptosis or cell death. So now you've got a hypercoagulable state induced by acute infectious process which then now you're rolling over a surface that's totally deendothelialized. You've lost the glycocalyx. So you have a hypercoagulable systemic state, a local vascular endothelial dysfunction, and guess what? The microthrombotic issues. But what's interesting is the hypercoagulable state also produces a potential for macrothrombosis, i.e. pulmonary emboli. So it's one of those sort of bad scenarios where um, you got micro, macro, and you got all the other issues. But the unique endotheliopathy that occurs, in my view, with the virus really contributes. Now, gram negative and other organisms cause endothelial injury as well, loss of glycocalyx, but they don't seem to produce the apoptetic cell death, i.e., the sodium shown by capsaic staining. So that is really, I think. Uh, and it's consistent with any infectious state. For instance, in that patient I first presented, the patient ended up having mycoplasma. But um, Professor Elami, uh, he is also an expert in vascular states, and we have other individuals, and, and Professor Rodriguez. Um, it would be great for them to weigh in, too, because this is an international perspective, and ça vaut mieux peut-être en France ou possiblement en Espagne, c'est bastante mejor. So if you can, like, why don't, can we let those guys weigh in as well? Is that okay? Okay, thank you. So I will I will pass the pass to El Alami. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I'm, you're running the show. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I will. So the question for El Alami is: If uh, do you think that if we if we manage to eliminate the virus, can we stop the process of hypercoagulability? and to change the degradation the the, the degradation process and the disease okay. process? No, you're right. You're right. As, as Gerald said, the, the, the storm uh, has a many, many consequences in the vascular compartment. And we must pay attention to that, let's say, uh, oxidative stress. And, and the stress is, is, is a small word with big consequences. And the stress is still there for a long period of time. And just as analogy, you have to pay attention, for example, in, the, in pregnancy with the postpartum period well known as a high risk period. And in some, let's say pregnant women, which is not a pathologic situation, the pregnancy, but we know that in the postpartum period with that, let's say uh, the, the, the conflict between the, the content and the contents. So the, the, the hypercoagulable state, it's, it's there for a long period of time, at least six weeks and sometimes 12 weeks in, in, some, in some particular let's say, profile of, of pregnant women. So we must pay attention to the risk factors in each COVID-19 patients. And in case of severe disease, for sure, the enemy, the prothrombotic, let's say, enemy is still there for a long period of time. And as you mentioned, all of you, so maybe we need to prolong that prophylaxis and that protection to cover and to, let's say, control this hypercoagulability in this patient for a long period of time. So another question, which is quite, uh, quite uh, 
relevant from the discussion we have is coming from uh, Corfu, Greece, and uh, from a colleague who is a medical, legal medicine there. He's one of the first who reported in Greece, uh, and he sent us a nice video with a clot uh, from a body. And uh, he says that he's asking if we should change the name of the coronavirus SARS-CoV to a thrombotic, uh, to another name that contains thrombosis. Meaning that uh, the problem is thrombosis and not just the uh, SIRS. But again, inflammation, coagulation are le, a, a synonym. So I think it's it's the, the both, let's say the, the, the two faces of, of the same, let's say, pathology. Uh, and uh, we, we have seen that there are many, many, uh, let's say, uh, actors leading to this dramatic situation. And the thrombosis, it's not the sole cause for death in this case. So in my opinion, the uh, uh, organ failure, the uh, cytokine storm, the uh, balance between, uh, the, let's say, the capacity of this uh, vascular compartment to, uh, let's say, control this hypercoagulability, et cetera, et cetera, all these are contributing to the clinical consequences. So in my opinion, it's a multi, for sure, it's like a Swiss knife model uh, virus with many, many consequences. But anyway, thrombosis is only one phase of this uh, not such diamond virus. A uh, question for Professor Rodriguez, Damelo. Damelo Rodriguez, sorry. Uh, is that uh, the presence of the mutation, uh, factor five later mutation in the population, which is quite high, the question says in uh, Spain. Do you think that it contributed to the high rate of uh, thrombosis and mortality in uh, Spain? Um, we don't know so far. I mean, uh, we uh, commonly we don't test for thrombophilia in acute se- in the acute setting of, of thrombosis. We wait for three three months to to test patients. So we have no information about that. We will have it because uh, we have many young patients uh, in my hospital. We have more than a hundred patients with BTE that we are following in the BTE clinic, and many of them, uh, especially those who are young, uh, we will have we will be tested for thrombophilia. Uh, if I have to guess, I would say that I would say that no. Uh, the prevalence of factor five latent mutation in Spain is around four, uh, three to five percent of the population, and uh, we know uh, we have uh, um, many studies demonstrating that the the, the weight of uh, factor five latent in the pathogenesis of thrombosis is actually low. We don't use uh, factor five latent uh, to uh, to take decisions uh, regarding anticoagulation in these patients. So. I don't think, I mean, it will play a role, but I think it's small, probably, in these patients. It's a question to Marc Garnier. It's, uh, do you, it is uh, impressive that you propose that the organization of the Intra-Hospital Committee for the Management of uh, Surgery, Program Surgery in COVID patients has to take into consideration the stock for the plasma, uh, for the transfusion, uh, and also for the drugs. Do you think that this strategy should be applied only during the the crisis of the COVID, or it should be established uh, in uh, in the institutions even during the calm period like now and uh, later on, waiting the second wave? <laughs> well, um, I believe uh, it's uh, of um, great, great interest during the crisis, but uh, I guess it's one of the... Uh, Feature that we adopted for the COVID-19 crisis that may last after the crisis. For instance, uh, in my hospital in Paris, uh, last week we have uh, an alert from our blood delivery agency, and the stocks of um, there is no stock for blood product with negative resus group, uh, no stock at all. So uh, all the surgery with a plan intraoperative transfusion have been delayed and postponed for at least one week. And uh, it's very difficult to, to make campaigns for blood donor as the usual local and the u- usual uh, place to collect the blood are now closed uh, until the end of June in Paris. Uh, and donor have not... Have not uh, Come back to 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 the to the to, to the collect um, 
places. So uh, the, the, the states of blood products uh, and even with a pharmacy for anesthetic uh, drug shortages uh, have been taken in account, yes. Thank you. And now a question is from Serbia, and I suppose it's for Professor Levy. Uh, is that uh, if you think that uh, thromboelastometry or thromboelastography could be used for the monitoring of uh, coagulopathy in ICU patients and optimization of the antithrombotic treatment? My lab did a, the work at Emory when I was at Emory on, on the work I got thromboelastometry, the ROTEM approved in the United States. I, I'm, I think if you can't get a fibrinogen level, it makes sense to do a TEG or ROTEM um, from a viscoelastic test because it, but to me, all it shows you is that the maximal clot firmness or maximal amplitude is elevated and you're hypercoagulable. But I mean, to me, anybody who's hyperfibrinogenemic um, is already hypercoagulable. Look at pregnancy. We talked about that. It goes to 600, you know, 500, 600, you know, milligrams per deciliter or five to six grams per, per liter. We've been studying fibrinogen, not only repletion, but also hypercoagulability for years. Too much is not good and not enough is not good. I'm not, I think it's great if you can't get a reasonably timely fibrinogen level. Other than that, to me, what you really see is maximal clot firmness, maximal amplitude on either test, and you use that as a hypercoagulable scenario. Yes, indeed, it looks at uh, some effect of platelet function, but it's highly driven by fibrinogen levels. And we used that years ago in our early work um, on fibrinogen repletion. So bottom line, yeah, it's a great test, but remember, we got to do other tests as well. And, and I, you know, D-dimer is an acute inflammatory marker as well. So I just think that, in quick comment, the lysis that you see on TEG and Rotem is exquisitely insensitive to, uh, to D-dimers. And, and I had a patient who ruptured his aorta, profound DIC, and we said Rotem, his D-dimers were greater than, you know, 100,000 nanograms or 100 mics per mil. But he had a total normal lysis on on Rotem. So bottom line, helpful but limited, my opinion. Yeah, we have the same the same, the same experience with uh, Rotem. It's a good tool, interesting, intellectually interesting uh, tool, but with a limited uh, useful useless is or not useless, but uh, it's not very useful in this context. Now I have a, co a question for uh, Dr. Konomakis. It comes from uh, Middle East. Apparently, it was not uh, clear the algorithm that you presented. So, could you specify how is this platform for the uh, COVID Compass? Sure. What we what we are doing is uh, getting all uh, the risk assessment models that you you are creating, and uh, with uh, with our tool, we are putting there all these uh, risk assessment models. In order to to use the to to give the healthcare professionals uh, a very user friendly tool in order to provide the data for for uh, the algorithms and then have a very humanized result for the healthcare professionals in order to support them in their uh, decision making. So uh, the, 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 all the model is based on. Uh, how we can put all the new risk assessment models that uh, your your uh, industry creates, and uh, as uh, for the for COVID nineteen, uh, it, it was something very new, and a lot of models uh, it had to be uh, created in uh, based in a few days in, or in a few months. So we have to uh, to give back to uh, healthcare professionals a tool in order to monitor uh, data through your uh, algorithm, so they are very uh, good qua quality data uh, since they are based on your algorithms, and then uh, we give back to the healthcare professionals recommendations uh, and supportive uh, uh, tools in order to 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 make uh, more uh, accurate uh, decisions. And then again, we use for analytics uh, all the data. Thank you very much.
And the last question, I think it's for all the panel, uh, is that if the development of the plasma tissue calicrine inhibitors uh, could be a good uh, target for uh, the treatment in uh, COVID patients. I suppose that the underlying idea is that uh, all the story starts from the interest and the contact system activation. So can I make a comment since uh, I've worked a lot with contact activation inhibitors, calicrine, first thing a protein is available in a, it's a reasonably potent calicrine inhibitor and it's actually available now in France. There is a drug that I worked extensively called for angioedema called um, Ecalinotide, originally was DX88, and it's approved, it's a calocrine inhibitor. The problem with inflammation is all of the amplification that occurs, block one pathway and everything else gets activated. Thrombin tends to override it. The bottom line is it's an interesting concept, but therapy has to be multimodal. And, um, you know, we can inhibit some of the serine proteases, but you still have the virus that rages on for days. Um, and creates the ongoing thromboinflammatory stimuli. Bottom line, interesting concept in the contact activation pathway probably is critical for some of these inflammatory, but the problem is that, you know, you need to, when you shoot skeet, you don't use a 308, 6 you use a blast of a shotgun, 12 gauge, sorry to do this US style, but anyhow, you need a multimodal therapy, my opinion. What, what does everybody else think? Uh, Professor Alami, I totally up. agree with you, Gerald, as, as usual. But I, I, I totally agree because, in fact, facing such again multi-dimensional uh, enemy, we need to, let's say, faces all these let's say consequences: anti-inflammatory drug, uh, potent anti-inflammatory drug, antiviral drug, uh, and the uh, anti-coagulant uh, and the. Uh, other, other, let's say, uh, recitation methods, et cetera, et cetera. So I think my opinion is that, let's say, we need a multidisciplinary, let's say, faculty to understand. So we need to, again, build a multi, uh, uh, let's say, a potential uh, approach to control all these issues in these complex uh, patients. So I totally agree with you. It's one, one proposal, uh, it's one finger, and we need, as Shiva, many hands to, to, to control that in, in COVID-19 patients. This is a good idea. Now, I, it's a, because of the issue on heparin and the monitoring of heparin using the anti a activity and not the APTT, this is something that we have to underline. Uh, there is a question regarding the heparin resistance in COVID patients and the potential role of heparinase uh, in patients with uh, uh, resistance to COVID. Any comments about that? Have you faced in Spain first uh, the res resistance to heparin? You know, I've done a lot of work with heparin resistance and cardiopulmonary extracorporeal circulation. Remember that your, your assay of pro -thromb a partial thromboplastin time is a clot-based assay. So hyperfibrinogenemia really makes it difficult. Thrombocytosis also, we release PF4 and neutralize the heparin. The problem is it's hyperfibrinogenemia. That's where the 10A assay is probably very helpful. But remember hypercoagulability is also a multiplicity of issues from microparticalization and all the things that happen. I, um, but heparin resistance with COVID-19 especially depends upon the assay that you use. The reality, and the antithrombin is relatively normal. It's the hyperfibrinogenemia that I think really significantly contributes. That's my thought. And that's basically on some of the other uh, heparin resistance scenarios that we have, you know, have, have looked at through the years. Thank you very much. So I have one last question is my question is that uh, in the paper that we are uh, going to publish soon that, that Ismail uh, developed, we had the observation that patients with COVID practically they have compensated the IC, not the over the IC. And there were about 10% uh, uh, or 8% of patients who appear with a compensated DIC score higher than five at the first day of admission to the emergency and then to the conventional uh, world. 
meaning that probably there are some patients at home who have this this, this type of, of, of DIC. And we were wondering with Ismaila, if, uh, if the score of the, the IASTH score that we have has been developed for uh, sepsis, and we should reconsider the score for DIC related to COVID. Do you think that it makes sense, this uh, approach? That's a really great question. There's different scoring systems. I know I work <laughs> closely with the ISDH, but the reality is I prefer the Japanese acute yeah. care medicine scoring, the JAM score, because it doesn't even look at fibrinogen. Yeah. The problem is that you can have profound DIC with a normal fibrinogen. Look at eclampsia. I mean, your fibrinogen is maybe 250, 300, and that's normal, but you have other issues. I think the problem is the scoring is all kind of complicated. The reality is that there's a sepsis-induced coagulopathy score that Toshiaki Iba, head of the DIC committee, has worked on. I think we need to do a better job. I think your point's extremely important. And even a funnier story, a couple of years ago, I sent emails to some well-known hematologists in the United States, and do you calculate DIC score in critically ill patients or in sick patients? And none of them said yes. But I mean, it's done a lot in Japan because they have antithrombin and recombinant thrombomodulin used extensively for bacterial infections. And it's part of the J Japanese algorithm, not in the sepsis-3 algorithms. Bottom line, great question, important perspective, and we need better scoring systems. And I think that was neat, some of the data that we saw earlier about some of the scoring. I, I, I apologize who, who presented that, but great question, important. And, and again, it shows the inadequacy of that. The, Fibrinogen probably shouldn't be included. The other, the sepsis score is probably better because it uses some of the um, sepsis data and looks primarily at, at prothrombin time and platelet count. To me, that's critical because if you lose your endothelium, you sequester and white cells too. Thank you very much. I think that we have to close now. I, I profoundly thank you for the participation to this uh, meeting. It's a real innovative and the uh, people who is attending is very happy and we have uh, reached high high levels of attendees thank you very much for participating soon we will create the database and uh, uh, in addition and i see I, I am sure that we will help the countries who do not have the experience to covid to improve the, the, the infrastructure and the networking and so we can save lives there thank you very much good night thank you. bye, bye.